Uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to call to order the September MTA board meeting held jointly with the Metro North Railroad and Long Island Railroad Committee, New York City Transit Committee, Bridges and Tunnels Committee, Finance Committee, Capital Program Oversight Committee, and Diversity Committee. We are conducting this meeting remotely via Zoom and conference call. Governor Cuomo's Executive Order 202.1, which has subsequently been extended, suspends the open meetings law requirements, and accordingly, any provisions in the MTA bylaws regarding public attendance at meetings and board members participating and voting by phone are also suspended. Now I'd like to ask our General Con Counsel, Tom Quigley, to do the official roll call for the record. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Board members, please indicate your presence uh, verbally and please make sure that your microphone is unmuted uh, as I'll now do the official roll call in alphabetical order. Uh, I see that Chairman Foy is present. Andrew Albert? Present. Commissioner Barbas? Present. Commissioner Borelli? Present. Commissioner Brown? Present. Commissioner Khaleesi? Present. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. Commissioner Fleischer. Present. Commissioner Glucksman. Present. Commissioner Herman. Present. Commissioner Jones. Present. Commissioner Lacewell. Present. Commissioner Law. Present. Commissioner Lynn. Present. Commissioner Mack, I have an indication he'll be joining the meeting late. Uh, Commissioner Mahaltas. Present. Commissioner Mojica. Present. Commissioner Samuelson. Yeah. Commissioner Schwartz. Present. Commissioner Tessitore. Present. Uh, and I have an indication that Commissioner Zuckerman will not be attending. Uh, let me try uh, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez one more time. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, later in the meeting, agency presidents and staff will submit procurements and actions for a vote. Uh, your presence at this meeting and silence at the time of a vote will be considered an affirmative vote for the record. If you would like to vote no or abstain, please state your name and your vote. Uh, we will now move into our virtual comment period. As with prior months, speakers were able to register on Monday and send in their comments by video. We'll play public comments now for 30 minutes and make the full public comment video available online. Hello. We have 26 members of the public registered to speak today. The first 30 minutes of public comment will be delivered at the board meeting and the remainder will be posted online for the public and board members on September 23rd. I would like to remind our public speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware that there will be a warning beep to remind you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Thank you for your patience and understanding throughout our virtual public comment session. Our first speaker is New York State Senator Joseph Adabo. Good afternoon to the uh, board to chair. I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and thank you very much for your efforts. Um, my name is Joe Adabo, State Senator for the 15th District. Uh, I want to thank all the MTA essential workers for getting us moving throughout the uh, pandemic. So thank you to all the workers and my prayers go out to the family and loved ones of the 131 trans workers who passed during the pandemic. Um, many of us understand the grim fiscal situation that the MTA is in due to the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, losing nearly about $200 million a week and a projected operating deficit of about $16 billion by the year 2024. Um, that's why it really is imperative uh, that the federal government give the MTA the federal stimulus of $12 billion uh, in order to sustain its services and its workers. Uh, we understand that if the MTA does not get that federal stimulus money, that you know possibly the $51.5 billion capital plan is at risk. Uh, by gutting that plan in order to offset some of these uh, costs and 
by not getting the federal stimulus, that would be devastating uh, for certainly the workers of the MTA and for the ridership. Uh, many of my constituents uh, rely on the MTA and the critical service that they provide daily uh, to get to their jobs, uh, to get around the borough, uh, such like the geographically isolated area of the Rockaway Peninsula. And my concern is uh, if we don't get that $12 billion of federal stimulus money, uh, we will be facing uh, possibly fare hikes uh, for our riders. So we cannot have a uh, roadmap to navigate New York City through this pandemic without that roadmap, including the $12 billion for federal stimulus for the MCA in order to protect its services, its workers, and to protect its riders. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity once again. Uh, I appreciate everyone's efforts and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Assemblywoman Stacy Pfeffer Amato. Good morning to the MTA board and to all the strap hangers watching this meeting. My name is Stacy Pfeffer Amato, and I am a New York State Assemblywoman that represents the 23rd Assembly District in Queens. First, let me thank the frontline workers of the MTA for being so brave during the pandemic and send my condolences to the family and friends of the workers who lost their lives serving the city. Thank you. My constituents have the unique but unwanted distinction of having the only interborough toll bridge in the entire state. The Cross Bay Veterans Memorial Bridge is in my district and spans one zip code from end to end. My constituents cross this toll bridge several times a day to conduct their daily lives. The Rockway rebate has always been an equitable compromise that my constituents depend on. The removal of this rebate is simply unacceptable and would cause serious financial harm to tens of thousands of my constituents. I understand the serious financial concerns the MTA, city and state are facing. That's why it's crucial that the federal government steps up and helps save our transit system. Without the federal relief, radical service cuts and layoffs would occur, and any chance of improving our system would never happen. The MTA, though imperfect, still facilitates a regional economy that accounts for 10% of the nation's gross domestic product, and we simply cannot recover and rebuild without a robust MTA. So let me be clear, at a time such as this, where there's great financial instability, the Rockway resident rebate is essential to my constituents, and that's why the federal government must step up and help save programs like that and the entire MTA system. Thank you. Our next speaker is council member Andrew Cohen. Uh, good morning. Uh, I really wanna echo some of the wise words of my colleague in the state Senate. Uh, I do wanna take a moment to recognize and thank and, and remember the over 130 transit workers who have passed from COVID-19 and all the dedicated transit workers that have kept New York moving through this unprecedented time. Of course, many of these hardworking people are my friends from TWU uh, and their families are in my thoughts and prayers. As we are aware as ever, that if not for the MTA and our transit workers, New York's essential workers, healthcare workers, first responders could not fight this crisis. Uh, it is for our heroic essential workers and all New Yorkers that we must ensure that the MTA can continue to provide transportation services in the face of this global health emergency and beyond. Uh, as New York City recovers from this pandemic, New Yorkers must have access to safe, equitable, and sustainable public transit options. As reported today, weekday subway ridership is still down more than 70% from the pre pandemic levels. The dramatic and sustained drop in ridership and revenue uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with increased costs needed to comply with health and safety guidelines, has disastrous consequences for all transit workers, riders, and commuters. Uh, if the MTA does not get the $12 billion from the federal government, bus and, survey, bus and subway service, as we know, will be unsustainable. And we could be facing cuts of 40% uh, for bus and subway, and commuter service could be cut by over 50% and the jobs of 7,200 workers are on the line. Much needed capital improvements like subway modernization, signal modernization, improvements to accessibility could be delayed indefinitely. For my constituents in the Northwest Bronx, including the communities of Woodlawn, Wakefield, uh, Van Cortland Village, Norwood, Bedford Park, and Riverdale, the majority of whom rely on public transportation to get around, these cuts will disproportionately hurt those who already struggle with an unequal transit system. 
senior citizens, people with disabilities, and individuals in low service areas will be particularly hard hit if federal aid does not come through. For essential workers and millions of people who continue to rely on public transit, their survival of our public transit system is paramount to achieving a fair and safe reopening uh, and overcoming this crisis. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mayor Thomas Roach. Good afternoon, Chairman Foy and members of the board. Uh, my name is Thomas Roach. I'm the mayor of the city of White Plains, and it's my pleasure to come before you today in support of additional funding from the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, I, as mayor of the city of White Plains, we have seen tremendous growth, uh, both in population and in our economy over the last several years. One of the linchpins to that growth is our access to transit provided by the MTA. The White Plains train station is the third busiest train station in the Metro North system behind Stanford and Grand Central. Um, the, what the White Plains train station is currently in the final stages of a complete overhaul uh, on the part of the MTA reflecting the level of transit that's passing through that facility every day. It has been a key component of our economy for quite some time and is expected to be so well into the future. Due to the pandemic, usage has dropped dramatically and needless to say, so has income to the MTA. Therefore, it's essential that that loss of income be made up uh, through federal support in order to maintain the system at the level it has been carried for the last several years and ensure an economic vitality in our region for the uh, years to come. We are a city that um, is, uh, you would say, a donor city, and we are in a donor state. And uh, we send more money out than we get back. But in order for us to re retain the economy that we have and continue to be able to produce that revenue and the jobs that we produce, uh, first rate mass transit is essential. So I'm asking that the federal government provide the necessary support to MTA so they can continue to do the job that they have done. Our next speaker is Mayor Ralph Ekstrand. Good morning, this is Mayor Ralph Ekstrand from the village of Farmingdale here. I'm here to make a plug for the Long Island Railroad. The Long Island Railroad was, we built our transit-oriented development around our railroad. Our railroad here in Farmingdale is our waterfront. Transit-oriented development, we brought in, myself and the village board, brought in over 350 new unit dwellings to and around our railroad station. Our ridership has increased before coronavirus up to 4,600 residents per day. That is amazing. We cannot cut our Long Island Railroad funding. I've been in village government for 12 years. I know how federal government has to subsidize our village. It has to subsidize the Long Island Railroad. We cannot cut our residents after we built all this transit-oriented development. We can't cut their rides. We can't cut their service. They moved here because of the railroad. It cannot be cut. Thank you very much for this brief message. I hope everybody is safe and well. Our next speaker is Jeff Lowinger. Hello, I'm Jeff Lowinger, president of Cubic Transportation Systems. First, I want to recognize the losses that New York authorities have experienced with COVID-19. Our hearts and prayers are with you. I was born in Mount Vernon, New York, and have fond memories of riding the subway and bus, so this cause is personal. The heart of New York City will always be its people, their strength, unmatched resilience, and unwavering allegiance to the New York way of life. This story is so much bigger than the five boroughs. It's a story that affects every corner of America. Cubic, our partners, employees, and their families are touched by the vitality of the MTA. Cubic's story spans 1,300 communities across our great land, from San Diego, California, to Tullahoma, Tennessee, and Sugarland, Texas. This story is also about hundreds of millions of dollars in materials from small, disadvantaged, and family-owned businesses all to keep our cities moving and thriving. What we do is for New York, the American people, and American-made jobs. For over two decades, we stood in support of the MTA transporting the region's workers, families, and visitors. From Midtown to Amherst, we have engineers and field technicians working side-by-side -side with MTA 
to deliver the new Omni system, we continue to be a proud partner and call New York home. We stood with New York after 9-11 and we stand now in support of the MTA in its campaign for additional federal funding relief to ensure that MTA success is America's success. We continue to contact our nation's elected, elected leaders to take action. Cubic remains committed to our investments to revitalize our economy with New York as its engine. A thriving MTA is a thriving USA. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Walker. Thank you. I'm Jessica Walker, President and CEO of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. We represent and support the business community uh, across Manhattan and New York City. My overarching message today is that mass transit is absolutely critical to New York City's comeback. And I just want to make three points uh, about that. First, uh, I absolutely want to recognize the transit workers who have passed away and um, uh, the many frontline workers continue to keep our city moving. Uh, you guys are, are the true heroes who have moved doctors and nurses and all the delivery people uh, who we need uh, to, to keep the city going. So thank you so much. We, we really do uh, appreciate all that, that you've done. Uh, second, I wanna offer our full support to the MTA for the request of $12 billion from the federal government uh, to cover the losses through 2021. The severe service cuts that would be required if this funding does not come through would absolutely set back our recovery and hurt our residents and businesses even further. And the gutting of the capital plan would erode our future economic prospects. Federal inaction would be unacceptable and self-defeating, I might add, since the national economy is so reliant on New York City's success. So we are 100% with the MTA as it seeks needed federal relief. And then finally, I wanna call on all of the leaders in uh, New York City and beyond to help the N MTA get the word out about safety measures. Um, as you know, MTA ridership remains extremely low uh, as compared to pre-pandemic levels. And this in turn is hurting our local economy because it is suppressing the foot traffic needed to support the restaurants and small businesses that are on the verge of collapse. And obviously this is because many riders are still concerned about sharing enclosed places with strangers um, right now during the pandemic. But uh, we, there is a lot of evidence that was shown in the New York Times uh, that indicates that riding mass transit is not a significant source of transmission. So we want, um, I myself ride the subway. Um, I've been briefed on the MTA's aggressive cleaning protocols here in New York City, and uh, I, I'm very confident in their approach. So I think that we're never gonna get back, to, we're not gonna get back anytime soon to the pre-pandemic ridership, but I think it is important uh, that all consumers uh, have the facts and, and know uh, that the that riding mass transit is uh, very helpful to our economy. Thank you so much, uh, and we stand with the MTA. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Forbes. Good morning, Chairman Foy and distinguished members of the board. My name is Jack Forbes. I am Vice President of Sales North America for Prevo Car US Inc., one of the main manufacturers of coach buses in the U.S. As you may know, Prevo and Nova Bus, two divisions of Volvo, have been doing business in the United States for many years, as well as with New York City Transit, of course. We opened our assembly plant in Plattsburgh, New York in 2009 and made considerable investments over the last decade. We have a very positive economic record in the state of New York with more than 400 employees and over 100 New York-based suppliers and more than 700 employees and 300 automotive suppliers in 32 states in the United States. Our operations have contributed to U.S. economic growth and by generating thousands of jobs for several suppliers whose existence depend on us. In 2019, Prevo was awarded two contracts from the MTA for up to 330 buses with a firm order of 307. These contracts not only maintain all the existing jobs at our plant in Plattsburgh, New York, but also created 25 new ones, plus an additional 15 during the build of these contracts. In addition, earlier this year, Nova Bus was awarded a contract for 165 hybrid buses with recently executed options for 126 hybrid buses and 209 diesel buses for a total of 500 buses. These contracts are significant boost for the employment in the region and New York and the US overall. I'd like to take the opportunity to reinforce Nova Bus and Prevo support for the MTA to APTA and to the transit industry as a whole and reiterate the necessity of the $12 billion of additional funding for New York City Transit, as well as the extension of the FAST Act, surface transportation law for one year. These funds are critical to maintain the manufacturing and supply chain and limit the enormous economic damage to public transportation businesses caused by the, by the pandemic. 
The situation not only affects transit agencies or cities, it affects jobs across the state and the nation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Anthony. Good morning, MTA board. Jason Anthony here from Passengers United. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things that has been bothering me since the beginning of the pandemic. One, lack of mass compliance. And two, how the MTA managers are treating their employees. I'm seeking of seeing MTA managers and supervisors get away with it, mistreating MTA employees and not uh, solidizing with those families who lost uh, relatives, friends or family members due to COVID-19. And not even attending the memorial that transit workers did in their honor in July. One last thing, uh, the Long Island Railroad mainline keeps being discriminated uh, because the MTA keeps providing service for a certain demographic, not in general. So therefore this could be a potential Title VI violation that also is discrimination. And one last thing I'm gonna say I've been seeing lack of max compliance since the beginning of the $50 fines. This fine too low, should be 100 or more. And I want to see better mass compliance and better collaboration between the MTA and transit police. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mo Yane Dam. Good afternoon, my name is Moeen Tom and I'm the New York researcher at Jobs to Move America. Jobs to Move America works to transform in the public tra contracting process to make sure the companies receiving public money use it to create good jobs that sustain communities and the environment. Along with our coalition partners in Electrify New York, we want to amplify the call for federal funding for the MTA. We encourage our federal legislators to reach an agreement on a stimulus package that ensures long-term financial recovery for the MTA and New York State. In addition, we encourage the Department of Transportation to give the guidance needed so the MTA can move forward with the environmental study required in order to implement the congestion pricing plan. With federal relief, the MTA can proceed with its capital program, which can also aid New York's and the nation's economic recovery. For example, MTA is committed to purchasing 500 electric buses in its current plan. These purchases can create good green jobs if the MTA adopts a manufacturing career policy in the procurement guidelines. The manufacturing career policy would ensure all purchases of electric buses use the U US employment plan, a proven best value procurement process. The USAP encourages manufacturers to commit to good wages and benefits while establishing pathways into the industry for people facing barriers to employment. These commitments would help ensure that the MTA's investments in electric buses also support family sustaining jobs and a skilled workforce. Maintaining the MTA's commitment to purchasing electric buses remains significant since buses have proven to be essential for the essential workers that kept New York City running during the pandemic. Despite current budgetary constraints, the MTA should not return to diesel buses and renewable natural gas. That will continue our reliance on polluting fossil fuels. By prioritizing electric bus routes in environmental justice communities, this, this can also help reduce the negative health impacts of air pollution in those areas. Jobs to Move America believes that we can have a cleaner environment and good jobs in the communities that need them the most. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian. Greetings, I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. September is a busy month. For many, it's back to school time and more people are heading into the office. It includes Rail Safety Week, which has taken on even greater meaning this year when the Long Island Railroad and Metro North will add educating riders about safe practices during a pandemic to their traditional efforts. We also recognize the importance of our infrastructure with an eponymous week, stressing how investing in our nation's transit infrastructure is critical for supporting economic recovery from the pandemic. There's a common theme that runs through these seeming disparate events, 
the immediate need for funding. More people riding the subways, buses, and railroads is a welcome sign as we settle into our next normal and hope for the continued good health of our city and region. Service must continue at levels that can accommodate the more riders and cleaning and disinfecting must continue to the same high standards so people feel comfortable coming back to the system. The capital program would continue the MTA safety and rebuilding efforts with signal upgrades, new rolling stock, station and accessibility improvements, and expansion projects like Penn Access and SAS Phase 2. None of this can happen without federal funding. This is not a New York problem. It's a national problem born of the pandemic. But if Congress doesn't deliver $12 billion in funding for the MTA, New York's pain will be the nation's pain. As Chairman Foy noted last week, the ripple effect would be felt from Kentucky to California. Last week, we and other advocates released a doomsday report highlighting the pain service cuts, fair hikes, and job loss would cause to Long Island. Unfortunately, the prospect of the doomsday scenario is too real and the hardship would be felt by everyone, whether they ride the system or not. The need is real and the time for Congress to act is now. Saving the MTA is critical for the region's recovery and by extension of its tremendous economic contribution, the nation's recovery. The MTA is made up of amazing people who work to improve the system every day. Kudos to the team that got the subways up and running for Monday's rush hour after the malicious act of a criminal. I'd also like to extend my warmest thanks and appreciation to Ellen Shannon, who will be retiring from PCAC in October after 18 years. I'll have much more to say next week, but I wanna recognize her and her valuable contributions today. On behalf of writers, thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Faust. Good morning, my name is Rachel Foss. I'm the Senior Research Analyst for reInvent Albany. We advocate for more transparent and accountable state government, including for authorities like the MTA. The federal government's continued failure to deliver additional COVID-19 emergency aid puts MTA riders in great jeopardy of severe service cuts. The MTA ran out of emergency aid from the CARES Act in July and is losing $200 million a week. The doomsday options presented in August by the MTA would be devastating, and even worse, don't even represent the full scope of cuts that could be needed for the MTA to balance its budget. As we wrote in an op-ed for Gotham Gazette this week, even if the MTA takes draconian action and cuts service 40 to 50%, raises full fares and tolls, and lays off thousands of workers, it will still need to find another $2 billion in revenue or cuts through 2021. If the massive cuts are sustained for four painful years, the MTA will still need to identify another $1 billion to close the full projected $16 billion deficit through 2024. The federal government must step in to provide the MTA billions in emergency aid. The MTA cannot cut its way out of this deficit without delivering a severe long-term blow to New York City, New York State, and the national economy. With our transit colleagues, we continue to press Congress to rescue the MTA from a fiscal calamity that will crush New York City and turn it from an engine of the national economy and number one donor state to the federal government into an agency living a hand-to-mouth existence. We thank the MTA for recently raising the warning that tens of thousands of jobs are at stake for MTA vendors across the country, which we also highlighted in our June report, investing in the MTA is investing in America. The state must also do its part and deliver to the MTA all of its dedicated funding. It's stunning we have to say this public to Albany at this time, but here we are. There should be no raids on MTA funds to make up for state general budget shortfalls. Currently, state and MTA budget documents assume a $600 million raid on MTA funds. Two wrongs will not make a right, and this planned raid makes a mockery of the whole idea of dedicated funds. The MTA's ridership is down 70%, and independent fiscal analysts believe the MTA is in much worse shape than the state. Lastly, we urge the MTA staff to publish the November financial plan well before the November board meeting. Given the uncertainty with the national election, we also ask that the MTA board consider voting on the 2021 budget in December, which is traditional, and when the political picture will be more clear. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Camper. Good morning, MTA board. My name is Matt Camper. I am the regional director for the Long Island Railroad for Passengers United. Uh, two things I want to talk about this month. First of all, um, I am in complete support of the um, competitive request for proposals for the uh, design build services for uh, the east side access for the Harold Kennedy construction. 
This is long overdue. The East Side Access Project should have been done many years ago. And this is a huge milestone that it access. And I'm really hoping that East Side Access is not put on the you know, table when it comes down to possibly not happening all because of if Washington does not pass another stimulus package. And on that note, in regards to the stimulus package, um, my riders out here on Long Island, if that does not happen, we don't have the stimulus package, it is going to be a a significant impact to us on Long Island. This could impact the way of life here on Long Island. This could cause the economy to go down here on Long Island and jobs will not, people will not be able to get jobs. This will cause issues with jobs. And if you are a person in Washington listening, you need to help us out, please. We desperately need the money because if we don't, the way of life in general here in the New York metropolitan area is not, it's not going to be what it was and may not be for many years to come. There's no way we are going to be able to get out of this for a long time. So we need the money now. Please, Washington, please help us. Please get at us out of this. And please make sure you pass that stimulus package now. Otherwise, it's going to be a bad situation. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlton D'Souza. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm the, my name is Charlton D'Souza. I'm the president of Passengers United. And I have to say a couple of things. One, the MT needs the bailout money from Washington. They desperately need that. But why are the elected officials coming on the MT's broadcast saying that? They should be calling all the senators in Washington and all the Congress people like I did and my team at Passengers United did. We sent them emails, we wrote letters. That's what should be happening. And also I do feel it's unfair for passengers like myself that we have to wait until the elected officials speak first. Uh, I don't think it's fair to the fair paying passengers. We should have a voice. And one of the things that I want to say is the lack of shuttle buses throughout the MT region is becoming a real issue. Um, for instance, like in Long Island, and um, if you look at what's happening with the Long Island Railroad, there's been no shuttle buses. Uh, people are being left stranded uh, to the cabs. Same thing at uh, Jamaica Center Parsons Archer on Saturday night. I was there for three hours helping people for the E-Train shuttle mess. And there was only three shuttle buses running to and from Jamaica Van Wick. That's ridiculous. A lot of your MT employees did not know that the Long Island Railroad was cross-honoring. In fact, many passengers don't know the Long Island Railroad is cross-honoring. So the MT needs to train all of its employees and direct them through the Long Island Railroad. And obviously with yesterday's derailment that happened, I feel that the homeless and the mentally ill, they have to be taken off the subways. We need a police officer at every subway station. And if the police cannot get the job done, bring in the National Guard. And I know I'm going to get criticized for this on social media, but it has to be done. The safety of the MTA employees and passengers is paramount. If you don't have please safety conclude your in the remarks, subway, please. Thank you. if you don't please have conclude. safety in the subway, it's an issue. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Gary Douglas. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Gary Douglas, President and CEO of the North Country Chamber of Commerce based in Plattsburgh. We're representing more than 4,200 employers and companies across five counties of the North Country. In 1995, when Plattsburgh Air Force Base closed, we adopted a potentially crazy mission and vision for our region of making ourselves a new center for the international production of transportation equipment. And thanks in no small part to the partnership that, that blossomed then and continues to this day between our region and the MTA, we now are at the center of a cluster of more than 50 transportation equipment manufacturers employing more than 9,000 people. And featuring uh, such major partners with the MTA as Bombardier, soon to be Alstom, Novabus, and Prevo, among many others uh, and many suppliers. 
Together, we've helped to retain more dollars within New York uh, from federal and state dollars invested in capital uh, equipment for the MTA by making it here and being ready to make more. Together, we've forged a strategically important and politically important connection between upstate and downstate, belying the old think that never the twain shall meet and that interests are either one or the other. In the case of the MTA, the interests are joined. And together, through North Country producers like Nova and Prevo, and upstate partners like BAE, we have positioned New York State at the very forefront of the upcoming transition to electric buses. We're ready to produce them for the MTA, but also for the country, North America, and the world. This is why we, the North Country business community, our federal and state representatives, including our congresswomen and certainly our two shared US, U.S. senators, are absolutely on board with the needed funding for the MTA in a relief bill as soon as possible as a North Country priority. It is not just a New York City or downstate priority. It is a North Country priority. We have been saying that, we will continue to say that, and let's not allow Washington to tear us apart. Uh, we are together on this, we're absolutely together. Let's lock arms more firmly than ever and help get this over the finish line. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that concludes public comment. Uh, we appreciate the support of all the public speakers, including elected officials and members of the public, for their support of our campaign for uh, federal funding. Uh, thank you for joining this month's virtual meeting of the MTA Board. Uh, while I wish I had better news to report, the reality is our dire financial situation remains unchanged from last month's emergency session. The MTA faces an existential threat where enfeeblement is the short-term risk and extinction the worst-case scenario. But the Senate majority yes, has yet to demonstrate that they recognize the seriousness of the situation and have so far shown no desire to address the problem in a meaningful manner. And action seems likely to continue in the coming weeks as Washington is now focused on a bitter battle over the upcoming United States Supreme Court nomination following the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg exemplified the best of New York, a Brooklyn native and staunch champion for equality who always spoke her mind and tirelessly fought for what's right. I note that one of our colleagues, Subash Iyer, previously clerked for the justice and is in Washington today standing vigil with the justice's other Supreme Court clerks. We all mourn her loss and will honor her memory with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. I'd like to focus my remarks this morning on jobs, because when it comes down to it, our campaign for federal funding is a jobs issue. We first start by recognizing the Herculean efforts our heroic employees have given during this unprecedented public health crisis. We lost 131 members of the MTA family, each of whom we continue to mourn. The women and men of the MTA have moved New York through the depths of this crisis and continue to do so today. And while service reductions and layoffs are a last resort, the looming financial deficits are so near and so large that every way of reducing costs quickly must be a serious consideration. We've noted before the importance of the MTA to the city, regional, and national economy, where the circulatory system that powers this region and this region contributes nearly 10 percent of the national economy uh, output. We've been working with economists to better understand just how much of an impact the MTA has and just how much the region would be affected if we had to implement some of the draconian options we laid out in August. A reduction in MTA service and headcount and the continued freeze of the capital plan would not only have a direct economic impact on our workers and the customers we serve, but a compounded, dramatic, indirect impact since a significantly cur curtailed system would make New York a less attractive place to live and work and invest. The preliminary analysis suggests that the service reductions and layoffs we discussed last month could cost the region over 350,000 jobs, most of those in New York City, and nearly $100 billion in economic activity in 2021. And outside New York, this could affect as many as 100,000 jobs created since 2011 through our capital expenditures. The projected regional job loss and destruction of economic activity would be an additional loss of nearly 
of all New York City jobs in August of this year and nearly 10 percent of economic activity for the year. Those are shocking numbers. Because of this reality, we sent letters last week to our largest vendors located across the country from Kentucky to Texas to California, explaining that without significant additional federal aid, all current and future contracts are in jeopardy. Our work with hundreds of, me of medium and smaller suppliers, including minority and women-owned firms, is also at risk. Our capital expenditures are among the nation's largest drivers of economic activity, generating almost $50 billion in infrastructure investment. But the COVID crisis could stop us in our tracks, devastating local economies in the process. In New York, thousands of good paying construction jobs would be decimated if we can't move forward with the historic 2020 to 24 capital plan. I've said it countless times before, there is no economic recovery without a healthy M MTA. And there is no national recovery without a healthy New York. We must protect the future of our region by protecting mass transit. There's no time to waste. Before we move on from this slide, I think it's important to note that the MTA capital plan and expenditures positively benefit every region of the state and almost all 50 states across the country. Let's talk about ridership. Although ridership continues to slowly recovery, recover, our losses are staggering and historic in nature, outpacing even the Great Depression, as the chart indicates. Subway ridership fell by 95% in the worst days of the pandemic. By comparison, ridership declined by just 12% on the subways by 1933, from the peak prior to the October 1929 stock market crash. On New York City, buses and streetcars ridership declined approximately 16% from 1929 levels. Today, buses are about 45% below pre-COVID-19 ridership levels. On the Long Island Railroad, ridership was flat in 1930, declined by about 7% in 1931, and, it's at, and at its worst was down a third from 1929 passenger levels. Long Island ridership today is still down about 75% from pre-pandemic levels six months later. And on Metronort's predecessor, the New York Central Railroad, estimated annual Grand Central Terminal ridership was about flat in 1930, and at its lowest point during the Great Depression, declined a third from 1929, compared to the startling current 80% decline in ridership on Metro North. In short, it's plain to see how the sustained and precipitous drops in ridership post-COVID are a serious consequence and a sign of how deep and lasting an impact the, the virus has had on the New York economy and are a direct gut punch to this agency since 50% of MTA revenues come from fares and tolls in a quote normal, close quote, year. It's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting the MTA harder than any past crisis and the near-term impact is much steeper. And this crisis re is reverberating throughout the national economy, economy and impacting states and cities as well. It's a crisis of such magnitude and prevalence that only the federal government has the resources to adequately address it. Without an immediate injection of $12 billion in federal aid, we have limited options including drastic service cuts and layoffs and borrowing, which options Bob outlined last month. These are not only difficult options, but acting on them would be extremely damaging to the recent progress of the organization. But we're required to balance the budget. While no decisions have been made, this could mean significant reductions in service and in positions, higher than scheduled fare and toll increases, and significant borrowing on top of the already frozen capital plan. And even if we do execute each of these options, we remain billions of dollars short and that reality is not going away until this pandemic goes away, which won't be for a while yet. All budget categories have been reviewed and are being reviewed again repeatedly to identify and eliminate any spending that is not essential to providing service or ensuring the safety of our customers and employees. The MTA is a proven track record of achieving annually recurring cost reductions, trimming $2.8 billion from the budget over the last several years pre-pandemic. Last month, Bob outlined an additional $540 million in, in savings, and I expect that number to exceed $600 million. These reductions would come from cuts in overtime, consultant contracts, and other non-personnel expense reductions, 
all thanks to the work of my agency president and colleagues and Mario Pelliquin. These savings span all agencies, headquarters included. Overtime will be reduced through 40 separate initiatives, each averaging over $5 million in savings. We will achieve these targets through tighter management controls, a narrowed focus on essential activities, and reimbursement for special event coverage. Consultant spending will be reduced by $115 million in 2020 through more than 50 initiatives and significant savings are expected from delivering on transformation. Other non-personnel reductions will save $210 million in 2021, including changes to non-revenue vehicle fleet management, adjustments to major maintenance and material contracts, and reducing spend across all our activities by purchasing less equipment, furniture, advertising, and more. And now a quick word on, on public safety. I want to acknowledge that there have been serious and concerning incidents recently, including Sunday's A-train derailment that put riders at risk. We're thankful these episodes were not worse. Sarah Feinberg will have more to say on this subject shortly. And before I conclude, I'd like to no note that it's been over a week since we instituted a $50 fine for refusing to wear a mask on mass transit and has proved to be a valuable tool encouraging mask usage across our system, which is already at high levels. In thousands of encounters with the public, MTA police and bridge and tunnel officers have issued just one summons, but helped more than 3,200 customers put on a mask or remind them how to wear it correctly. Over the last period of months, we've distributed over well over 3 million masks, which have been contributed by the state of New York and the city of New York. In addition, we continue to have hundreds of volunteers out in the system. As, as you see on the slide, the gentleman in the yellow, a distinctive yellow T-shirt, uh, is part of our mass force. The program's been a huge success and it reinforces what we've been saying all along. Wearing a mask helps promote public health and masks help protect us all. I want to thank New Yorkers for embracing our message that wearing a mask is an act of respect to their fellow commuters and our employees. The community spirit is deeply appreciated as we continue to come together and respect each other in mitigating the spread of the virus. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pat Warren. Thank you, Chairman. The health and uh, safety, as always, is our number one priority here at the MTA. Due to the series of safety measures that have been implemented throughout the pandemic, the MTA is completing four months with extremely low numbers of new positive COVID-19 cases in the low single digits, zero, one, or two per day, as well as no new fatalities. Our recent uh, of recent significance, our deterrence efforts, put in place almost four weeks ago to protect our heroic bus drivers and enable front door boarding on buses has been successful as the rate of bus drivers contracting COVID-19 has remained um, almost nil. Further, our aggressive application of safety protocols is also delivering transportation to now close to 2.8 million customers daily that is among the safest in the world and con contributes to keeping New York's rate of contracting COVID-19 below 1%. Our safety measures include uh, providing over 11.7 million masks um, to employees and customers, 10.5 million pairs of gloves, 72,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, 7.1 million sanitizing wipes, and 177,000 gallons of cleaning solution. Further, we continue our aggressive and daily cleaning and disinfecting of stations, trains, buses, paratransit vehicles, and employee workspaces. As you are aware, the wearing of facial coverings is now touted by um, health professionals as the single most effective deterrent to contracting COVID-19. Consequently, MTA is doing all it can to maintain proper mask usage within the transportation system. Our efforts include a significant media campaign, providing free masks upon requests to customers at stations, on buses, and from our staff. And it was just mentioned, we continue our popular mask force program where volunteers um, from MTA and the public are out on our trains, buses, and stations reminding customers to wear masks and offering free masks. We also have MTA police, bridge and tunnel officers, and New York City Transit Eagle uh, team agents in stations and riding within the system reminding customers to wear a mask and enforce mask usage if necessary, including the new $50 fine that was added to the toolbox this month. Perhaps predictably, our, war, our law enforcement officers have observed virtually 100% compliance when they approach customers and remind them to wear their facial coverings. 
on the rare occasion where, where our officers have to use their persuasive verbal skills to get reluctant um, customers to don their masks, the other customers in the vehicle cheer their efforts. So far, our officers have um, had uh, only the need to issue one summons, as was just mentioned, as our New York uh, customers are demonstrating the respect of one another that we have come to observe throughout this entire uh, crisis. Well done, New York, and thank you. All the actions we have taken thus far have delivered a mask usage rate over 90 percent on our trains and 95 plus percent on our buses. That said, we, uh, we will continue our efforts and attempt to identify new approaches to sustain mask use levels and drive uh, these levels closer to 100 percent. The health community and the MTA are both concerned and preparing to uh, protect our employees and customers from a predicted second wave of COVID-19 as cold weather approaches in the New York metropolitan area. To this end, we are focused on four lines of efforts. First, we are in the throes of rolling out a flu shot immunization campaign to strengthen our employees' ability to fight this illness that has symptoms that are, um, resemble COVID-19 and would otherwise weaken their immune system. The program includes making it easier for our um, employees to receive their shots by delivering immunizations to our employees at, their medical, at our medical facilities, in yards, depots, and select offices. We are further uh, partnering with pharmacies and other health care providers to provide flu shots at no cost to our employees. We will also continue a robust ca um, communications campaign to highlight the importance of getting a flu shot this year in light of the dual threat of flu and COVID-19 which some health professionals have labeled a twindemic. We have, uh, we'll have more uh, on this next month. Our second line of effort to deter the second wave of our employees contracting COVID-19 is that we are pursuing, pursuing cutting edge rapid diagnostic testing protocols to provide more effective early screening of employees and contractors that live outside the New York City, uh, New York metropolitan area before they encounter our workforce and customers. Further, we are standing up mobile diagnostic teams that will be able to deploy to field locations to facilitate comprehensive testing of employees who may have uh, come in contact with a COVID-19 positive colleague. We are also seeking new inexpensive rapid testing protocols that could further help identify individuals who have contracted the virus but are asymptomatic, this to limit their ability to expose others to the virus. Third. We are carefully monitoring our employees that test positive for the virus and have developed decision matrices that allow us to rapidly ramp up um, our COVID-19 support efforts, such as increasing the number of individuals working our Carl Centers, in order to better manage co um, contract, contact tracing, information dissemination, and other health and safety support. Fourth, agencies have developed decision tools uh, which provide the ability to adjust their service levels based on employee availability due to COVID-19 infection and uh, or close contact quarantines. I'd also take a moment now to note um, we continue to focus on air quality and improve ventilation both in our system and across our occupational facilities. We have performed an um, enclosed area risk assessment, which includes assessing the size, temperature, uh, temperature and ventilation system design and airflow rates. HVAC systems have already been, uh, been uh, this has already been assessed on HVAC systems at most facilities and key locations have been upgraded or otherwise improved. Additionally, the rate of uh, fresh air exchange on subways ranges between 18 and 25 times per hour, which exceeds the uh, minimum rates of air exchange per hour cited by the CDC for certain health care facilities. In short, our work exploring different types of innovative air filters and other technologies to prevent the um, spread of COVID-19 continue, um, uh, continue. I will uh, close by noting that MTA continues all of its other programs for around the clock cleaning and disinfecting its facilities and equipment, providing personal protective equipment, improving air quality, providing diagnostic and antibody testing, and supporting the advancement of new technologies and health protocols that hold promise to assist in keeping our employees and customers safe. Chairman, this concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Any uh, questions for uh, Pat Warren? All right, thanks. Uh, next, we'll move to Bob Foran, our Chief Financial Officer, an update on MTA finances. Bob and I continue to be laser focused on our financial si situation and are managing accordingly. Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just highlight a few items. 
First, a week and a half ago, we were downgraded once again by Moody's. Uh, they took us on the transportation revenue bonds from double A, or excuse me, from A2 to A3. This was in advance of the sale on a competitive basis last Tuesday of 900 million in long-term bonds for our capital program. Uh, there were three tranches, a 20, 300 million each, a 25-year, a 28-year, and a 30-year offering. Uh, we received bids from eight different firms for each of the three. Um, I'd have to say that the spread to market index was significantly higher than what we have historically uh, seen. Historically, pre-pandemic, we were trading probably 40, 45 to 65 basis points over MMD, that's a municipal market index. Uh, these bids came in at 277 basis points to 295 basis points over the index. Again, we appreciate the market's support for our capital program, but it is expensive given our dire financial straits. The all-in TIC uh, for the combined 900 was 4.49 percent. Included with the finance materials on director's desk is the budget watch for September. Uh, it reports on operations for August and subsidies through September. Um, there are some positives that you'll see here. First, operating revenues versus the July plan are $131 million better. Uh, that's about $34 million in terms of fares and about $97 million in terms of tolls. Um, subsidies. Most subsidies, about $77 million higher than the July plan. The real estate taxes, $47 million higher than July plan for a combined positive variance versus July of 124. So total versus the July plan, $255 million better. However, I have to say that when you compare the actual results right now, year to date, through uh, August and into September with the subsidies, we are still roughly $3.8 billion below what we were in the budgeted forecast back in February. Operating expenses, we're positive, favorable variance, about $555 million, about $258 million, roughly half of that has come through the transformation efforts in our hiring freeze, which has caused us, and you'll hear about this later, uh, to have significant uh, vacancies, attrition, that we will make permanent to save the money. Um, we also have debt service savings of about 33 million. So total operating expense, positive variance of 588. So combined, we are positive versus the July plan of about $843 million. We hope that that will continue through the year, that we don't give up anything on those, in terms of those positive variances, but we are moving forward. But again, Relative to where we were in February, we are still significantly, 3.8 billion just on the revenue side, below where we were at that point in time. Um, Mr. Chairman, that is, concludes my comments. Thank you, Bob. Uh, any questions? Mr. For Chairman. Bob? Commissioner Schwartz. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Schwartz. Yeah, if you don't mind, as chair of the Finance Committee, I, I'd like to um, say a few things and comment on Bob's presentation. Listen, uh, the sad reality in, in listening to uh, Bob's comments and what we've heard at our previous board meetings and from other uh, members of the MTA, including your presentation this morning, is regardless of the tremendous efforts and outcry made by the MTA, our riders, our congressional delegation, our governor, and other state elected officials to date, our calls for federal assistance has fallen on deaf ears by our Congress and by the federal government. Washington elected officials love coming to New York to raise money and the federal government likes to take New Yorkers uh, income taxes to help out other states around the country. But when it comes to helping New York State and the MTA, through no fault of its own, dealing with a global health crisis, a pandemic health crisis, all we do is get an ice cold reception from Washington DC when it comes to help. And listen, 
I'm all in favor of helping out our airports and our airlines who are also going through tremendous financial problems. But the fact of the matter is we have more people going through the MTA's mass transit system than we do having going through our regional airports and using them. And it is, it is a sad reality that Washington, D.C. has failed to recognize this and failed to respond to our requests. The other sad reality is, is that there is no way the MTA is going to be able to cut its way out of this financial problem that we're in. There is no way, the sad reality is there's no way we're going to be able to reduce services 40 and 50 percent and maintain our local economy and our state economy. The sad reality is we're not going to know before the November election or maybe not till sometime in early 2021 whether we're going to get any help from Washington and how much that's going to be. Yet, the reality for this board and for the MTA is we're supposed to adopt a budget in December for 2021. So as chair of the Finance Committee, I'm asking for the following. I'm asking Bob Ferran and his financial team to begin the process of applying for the maximum amount of money under the Municipal Lending Facility Corporation of $2.9 billion. If we pledge the PMT against the borrowing, the interest rate, I've been told, it would be approximately 1.8%. That is the cheapest money that the MTA will ever be able to get as a loan. The other thing is, by borrowing money from the municipal lending facility, my understanding is if Washington does come through and helps us out, whether it's in November, December, or early next year, we're allowed and able to pay back the money we borrowed under the MLF early without any penalty. But the reality is, regardless of the heroic efforts that have been made to save money, whether it's cutting back over time, reducing consulting contracts, and the whole list of other things that we've done, we need a financial bridge. We need to deal with our cash flow. The sad reality is, is the MTA is going to run out of money in December of 2020. We cannot allow that to happen. We cannot wait any longer for Washington to act because the reality is they are not going to act regardless of what our congressional delegation does, regardless of what all our elected officials here in New York do and say. The reality is we're not going to get any um, help until way after um, the November election. So I'm asking that Bob begin the process of moving forward. I would also say to my colleagues on the board that no action will be taken until we're ready to go. And that I am also gonna request that a, a budget and a plan be put together on how we would spend this money when we would need to spend the money and every single dollar of the borrowing of the 2.9 billion dollars would have to be approved by the board before any of it can be allocated that would go for operating expenses and any and all capital expenses it would require board approval but i'm afraid at, at this point even though it's late september that a month from now, we were going to be in the same exact position that we were in May, June, July, August. And so we have to be realistic. We need to be responsible. 
I don't want to wait to the last minute. I think we all know what the real reality is here. It's sad that it's come to this point. But again, I'm requesting, Bob, you begin the process of moving forward um, so you can come back to the board in a timely fashion. Um, because there is no way we can pass a budget for next year when we're going to run out of money before the end of this year. And again, we're not going to know realistically in a best case scenario until late November, December. I really don't believe we would even know, depending on the, how the election outcome is whether or not we would be able to get any uh, financial help until the first quarter of 2021. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I think we need to move forward and, and I'm, I'm asking Bob as chair of the finance committee to move forward uh, and begin the process of um, uh, looking to, of contacting the MLF about and putting together a process about how we would go about borrowing the maximum amount. Uh, we, we will do that. Obviously, we have successfully accessed the MLF uh, about a month ago. Uh, that saved us uh, 80 basis points or $12 million over the uh, life of that borrowing, and uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will do that and uh, come back to the board. Any, any, any other uh, comments uh, on uh, Bob's uh, presentation? Uh, Pat, it's Bob Lynn. Bob. So, Pat, you've described the MTA financial predicament as like a four alarm fire or a five alarm of fire or a tsunami. Uh, perhaps another good analogy might be a category five hurricane uh, and that we've been hit by hurricane COVID. Um, throughout our lives, uh, without controversy, the federal government would step in in these types of situations of a huge hurricane um, and cover the cost and let the assist the community to return to uh, life before the hurricane. Uh, for the MTA, this was done in small part um, in the spring, but over the last several months, it has been clear uh, that the COVID disasters left the MTA, the state, the city uh, workers uh, in huge additional financial loss that's not been covered. Um, sadly, so far, the president and the Senate Republicans uh, have refused any additional assistance. Um, the very real dilemma, and I think I want to uh, pattern, uh, follow some of uh, Larry's comments, the very real dilemma for us is that we're in October um, and we face at least, uh, after uh, Bob's comments, at least a $3 billion gap remaining in this calendar year and a huge, huge deficit uh, for 21. Um, so perhaps uh, Kevin Law's terrific letter from the New York business community will prevail uh, and would soon get additional funding, or perhaps, uh, and hopefully Biden wins and Democrats gain control of the Senate and a bill that should have been passed now uh, becomes law at the end of January uh, 21. Uh, but, and let us hope that our financial crisis is solved that way. But I think reflecting uh, Larry's points, um, we know that if we don't wind up getting all the federal assistance or if it's tremendously delayed, um, that we will have a major controversy. And I think, Pat, you and Bob have said any number of times, in that case, uh, all options are on the table. I think what's clear, should be clear to everyone at the board, and as uh, reflected in some of the comments we heard from the public uh, today, uh, that there are uh, many options to need to be considered, and some make more sense than others. For example, uh, what service cuts? Uh, has COVID uh, changed the demand for service forever? Uh, and we need to think about that. Uh, which enhanced revenues uh, will work? What are, what's fair? Um, what borrowing? The MLF is an interesting idea and obviously should be pursued, but it has to be part of a, a broader set of uh, approaches. Um, what delays in payments that's been discussed uh, make sense? Uh, do we have to consider delivering services in a much different way going forward. Um, in short, it is critical that we as a board engage in a reasoned, data-driven discussion regarding how to move forward. It includes all of the items. As you say, all options on the table, we need to review them together. 
Uh, and I, for one, think that the board, with all of the luminaries on this board, is ready for such a discussion, but not in a response to a plan that is given to us as a fait accompli with just a few days remaining before it needs to be implemented. So, Pat, I humbly ask uh, that when the discussion is required, it seems that some uh, is, decided, is required very soon, that you create a process for the board to fully participate and wisely contribute to determining the MTA's roadmap that lays out the future of public transit in New York City after COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, anyone else? All right, uh, I'm going to call on uh, Jano Lieber to uh, provide an update on CND and uh, the uh, CPOC book. Jano. Good morning. Uh, at the board, with the board's indulgence, I want to give a quick report on stations, a bit of routine business, because that is the focus of this month's CPOC report. The IEC, the independent engineering consultant, and I are on hand to answer any questions about the material in the book. Stations. We've made a really good progress on a number of station projects. Since late July, we've opened five new ADA stations. I've done that together with Sarah Feinberg and our colleagues at Transit, Chambers Street, First Avenue, Bedford Avenue, Astoria Boulevard, 86th Street in Brooklyn, and pretty soon we're going to open Bedford Park Boulevard as well. Um, we've replaced elevators, escalators, and other major station components at dozens of stations, including, and you see it pictured in the photo on the slide, the, busy, the escalator and uh, stairway combination as well as the finishes at the busiest single subway entrance in New York, uh, that's the Lexington Avenue passage, I mean the, uh, the uh, 42nd Street uh, pa uh, passage entrance to Grand Central's subway stations. And we did that many months in advance of schedule. Uh, sorry. Um, during the pandemic, we also made huge upgrades to that historically dilapidated and chaotic Grand Central subway station mezzanine, increasing circulation space for, by 30 percent and adding 40 percent more ac uh, stairways and elevators to provide access to the platforms. And of course, we also now, as of last week, have a, a brand new entrance to Grand Central from the uh, recently opened one Vanderbilt skyscraper. Taking advantage of low ridership, we're also making huge progress on outage-intensive major projects, the Queens Boulevard and 8th Avenue Line CBTC projects, the Culver CBTC project, the Rutgers Tunnel, Archer Avenue uh, track work major project, Eastern Parkway structures. We're getting a ton of work done, and this is in large part the product of the acceleration initiative uh, set in motion um, by Governor Cuomo. Uh, in fact, this is the first time in history that we have three CBTC projects working simultaneously. I, I need to acknowledge the New York City Transit team, including the tremendous in-house support from transit employees. But you also may recall that the plan we announced back in January was to award 39 ADA stations this year as part of our uh, 20 to 24, 70 ADA station plan and also finishing uh, a number of stations from the 15 to 19 plan. Um, with support from CFO Bob Foran, we've managed to award four ADA station projects to date and we'll be awarding 11 more, nearly all of which are federally funded, which means it's use it or lose it money uh, and, and, and we are putting it to work. But that means uh, that of the 39 stations we committed to at the beginning of this calendar year, 24 are, will likely not be awarded this year because of financial uncertainty. Likewise, the financial crisis is hitting the schedule for major projects uh, uh, worth billions. Projects like Penn Station Access, sometimes known as four stations in the Bronx, that was going to bring Metro North into Penn Station. The Second Avenue Subway Phase 2, 
the hundred new electric buses we committed to acquire, but also smaller high-impact initiatives like substations and power repairs, communications work, and additional non-ADA station repairs. All of those are essential to keeping our system in good working order, state of good repair, as we call it. But they're unable to be funded given the financial crisis. Make no mistake, the pause of our capital program has real consequences. We're still hoping and expecting, as the chairman said, that the federal government will step up. But we won't be able to make up all the time we've already lost. And it needs to be understood that putting off critical work of this kind is going to put at risk the reliability and capacity of our nation's premier transit system. That concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jano. Any questions for Jano? Uh, Victor? Commissioner. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jano. I'm excited to see that some accessible stations are moving forward, and um, I, I, I hope to see more in the future. Um, uh, but if we don't get this federal funding, we're it's definitely going to be tough. Um, and, I, and I know that um, you're working hard at that and we'll continue to work with you. Um, I'm, I know that there's been some change at um, the MTA and um, Alex Olagudin has moved forward and is uh, now in the governor's office. I um, hopefully um, we'll see more action from him on that side and we can get some more support there as well. But I'd be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the transit system um, accessibility team and uh, the great strides that they made on putting people with disabilities in the forefront. And I know that Rachel Cohn's gonna be um, working on some of the stuff and it's in her capable hands until a replacement for um, Alex is found. And um, I know that there is also going to be um, a bigger push for accessibility uh, to replace Alex. And I look forward to, to that uh, position being posted and working on that as well. So I'm excited about, um, about the possibility of that. And I personally wanna thank uh, Transit and the commuter railroads um, for, for their efforts and hopefully see accessibility teams uh, put in there as well and not just um, in uh, MTA headquarters. So thank you and uh, please keep up the good work. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I'll call on uh, Anthony McCord for a uh, transformation update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's get this slide up. There we go. Uh, transformation at the MTA, as you know, was mandated by the governor and the legislature over a year ago with the goal of changing the way we work. Our mission, Transformation, is to deliver customers the world-class system they deserve by making the MTA more efficient, cost-effective, and modern, while making it easier for our employees to do a great job. Implementation of Transformation began a year ago. Uh, with uh, board approval of the Alex Partners Plan uh, uh, report in July 2019 and actively started earlier this year with the creation of the MTA transformation team. During the height of the COVID-19 crisis in New York, uh, my team, we paused transformation and we focused solely on augmenting our pandemic response efforts to protect customers and employees. This in support of the agencies and other operational leadership uh, executives and managers and frontline staff. Members of my team helped make uh, process changes quickly and safely to allow the MTA, MTA to adapt to our new reality and to keep New York moving when employees were either working remotely or were actually quarantined. Now, as we continue to combat the pandemic and to respond to the unprecedented fiscal crisis it has created, a five alarm fiscal fire, our mission is now even more important. To explain this, please let me highlight uh, a key point. Our transformation, our transformation at the MTA is about consolidating back office and administrative functions. This is a common transformation in public sector services across the country and in all areas of public service. Our objective at the MTA is to better share and align scarce resources MTA-wide. Now, this is even more important during these fiscally constrained times. 
Transformation allows us to do better and more with less. In the present fiscal crisis, this is a critical way to reduce cost, increase efficiency without reducing service. Today I'm going to update you specifically on the three key parts of the MTA's transformation program. Reduction in force, consolidation, and process improvement. Reduction in force. The Alex Partners plan included a target of reducing petitions at the MTA by 2,700. There's actually some good news here. Because of planned retirements by the end of the year and a higher overall attrition rate amongst those delivering functional and administrative services, we expect to meet the Alex Partners target without the need for layoffs. I think the COVID crisis has had a lot of impact on many, many people, including many of our employees who have made personal decisions to do other things with their lives. We have always said that we hope to achieve this reduction in positions through, attri through attrition, and today I'm reporting back that we're actually on track to do just that. Of course, I will also note we're facing the worst fiscal crisis in MTA's history. So there is one caveat to my report today, and that is that layoffs will be required if the federal government does not provide the MTA the $12 billion in COVID emergency relief funds we are seeking to get us through 2021 as we have previously stated. There are two other parts to transformation. I actually think they're the most important parts for improving the MTA, improving our resilience and reducing our costs and, and uh, keeping service levels where we want them to be. Our work is not done. A central part of the Alex Partners plan is consolidation of the functions MTA wide. Transformation's focus is to reduce cost and improve effectiveness. While that work is continuing, we've already achieved consolidation in key areas. Budget and accounting under Bob Ferran's leadership. Communications under Abby Collins. Diversity and EEO under Mike Garner's leadership. Legal under Tom Quigley. People and labor relations under Paul Fama. Procurement under Kuvesh Ayer and technology under RAF Portnoy. We've also consolidated compliance and audit and internal controls and are success successfully um, supporting the successful consolidation of our construction and development activities driven by Drano Lieber and his team. And I think the presentation that Jandro just shared with us is, is um, a testimony to what a consolidated can team can do uh, with much reduced resources. All of these consolidations enable us to better share resources, align goals, deliver improved outcomes for our customers, and uh, for our customers. And importantly, as the MTA moves into a critical juncture of its existence, they will allow us to maintain functional services at a much lower cost. And I'd like to say every dollar, every dollar we save here is a dollar that can be used towards service. I now turn to process improvements. These consolidations allow us to better share resources, align goals, and deliver improved outcomes for our customers. Consolidation also makes it possible to re-engineer functional business processes MTA-wide to further improve service outcomes, further save money for service. These are now possible thanks to the consolidated functions. Well, that should be hopefully evident. I'd also like to say that in an effort to practice what we preach, the transformation team has delivered all of this work internally and in partnership with the agencies without the help of external consultants or contractors. We have also reviewed all open service contracts and were able to reduce them as Pat Foy, the chair, mentioned, by $155, about $155 million over five years. I should also add that these transformation savings do not include the actions taken by agency presidents and the CEO, and led by Pat and Bob, 
to immediately find additional cost reductions on the operating side. Pat already touched on these numbers, but they're materially important, so I repeat them. The savings amount to $540 million in 2021, including $215 million in overtime spending reductions, $115 million in consulting contract reductions, and $210 million in other non-personnel expense reductions. It's a genuine team effort. We are now focused on additional non-labor savings these lean down and consolidated functions now enable. All of these savings, all of these savings reconciled to responsibility codes auditable in the MTA's financial accounts. The bottom line is that transformation is about modernizing the MTA. We are a large organization, we need to evolve with the times, and the pandemic has put new urgency behind that effort. We need to be more efficient, need to do things faster and better, and need to deliver improved outcomes for customers. This effort's about one thing, a modern, effective, efficient MTA that is worthy of New York and that will allow us to continue operating for the benefit of all taxpayers and riders well into the future, regardless of the circumstances we face. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, any questions for Anthony? Pat, I do. Vinny Tessitore. Commissioner. I, I don't have uh, a question. I, I have a comment. Um, you know, listen, this is something that we do have control over. And this is something that we have to rethink for the future. And my intent is to not to discredit any individual or any member of any transformation team. But uh, I, I just have to simply say we did not need a transformation team. We do not need a transformation team moving forward. We didn't need to expand our management base and seek outside help and reports to tell us what, what this agency is very capable of doing on its own. Headquarters has the ability to consolidate and organize as being experts in the transit and transportation industry. The agency leaders have sufficient teams to be able to clearly identify where there needs to be savings and they've done it consistently for this past Last year, there has been added stress throughout all the agencies amongst management to, to figure out ways of justifying which jobs are important and, and what jobs are necessary, who to cut, who not to cut. This was unneeded. And, and I, again, I mean it, mean it in the most respectful way. We, we need to manage our own place without expanding on our management team to do so. Uh, uh, perhaps these 2,700 bodies, you know, that's a good news story, great, through attrition and through the, the uh, effects of this uh, uh, horrific virus, but it wasn't necessary. It isn't necessary moving forward. The board has control over this. I think it's time that we slim down on this type of, of oversight and, and let the agency just focus on moving forward and rebuilding this place. The only positions that should be added or positions that are going to be here for the future to enable safety and service and growth and infrastructure and when we have the money to do it. But uh, this transformation, uh, 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 again, no disrespect, but it, it, it's, it should be complete at this point and we need to move on and take on the bigger battles ahead. Thank, uh, th you. thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any, uh, any other comments? All right, th uh, thank you. Uh, the minutes of the Pat, July, Pat. Commissioner, uh, General Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to confirm the attendance of uh, two board members who I believe may have joined us after the start of the meeting. When I call your name, please uh, indicate your, your attendance verbally and please make sure your microphone is not on mute. Uh, Commissioner Cortez Vasquez. Yes, here I am, President. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mack. I see Commissioner Mack on the, sc on the screen. Commissioner Mack, I see you on the screen. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we still have a quorum. Well done. Uh, the minutes of July's joint meeting and minutes from each committee, as well as minutes from the August uh, special board meeting, have been distributed to all members. Are there any corrections or omissions? If not, I second it. 
I move it. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Minutes are approved. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Tom Quigley to introduce an uh, item for the full board relating to MTA agencies' rules of conduct. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are seeking board approval to finalize and adopt amendments to the rules of conduct for uh, New York City Transit, MAPSTOA, Staten Island Railway, uh, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad. Uh, these amendments to our rules were first put into effect on an emergency basis in April of 2020. Uh, as required by state law, these amendments to the rules of conduct were published and the public was invited to submit comments. Notably, no public comments were received. Generally, these amendments are designed to improve the safety and cleanliness throughout the system. This is especially important as we strive, uh, as we strive to keep the trains, buses, stations, and terminals clean and sanitary throughout the pandemic. Uh, the specific revisions to the rules are set forth in the staff summary, and the amendments themselves are contained in the briefing materials that you've all received. Uh, we ask the board to adopt these amendments and, and convert them into final rules of conduct, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tom. Any uh, questions uh, or comments on this item? I, I just have one question, Pat. Andrew. Uh, Tom, where, where, where was the invitation to comment on these proposed rules uh, published? In the state register, and that is the, uh, that's required by state law uh, for uh, rules of this nature. And that's the only place? That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I second the approval of the amendments. Good. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Kathy Rinaldi on Metro North Railroad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to just deliver some brief remarks um, touching first upon August service delivery, and it's difficult to do that without talking about the impacts of Tropical Storm Isaias, which hit the region on Tuesday, August 4th. Um, in its path, this storm blew more than 300 trees down across Metro North's tracks and into its catenary systems. As always, the awesome and dedicated workforce of Metro North quickly responded, working day and night. By the Monday following the storm, we were running a normal schedule with only the upper Harlem line left to be restored and returned to service. Out of the entire MTA network, the upper Harlem line was the hardest hit by the effects of the storm. Um, more, more trees were down and more damage was sustained in this territory than during Hurricane Sandy. Trees and branches on the line were ensnared in the utility wires that run alongside the tracks. And clearing the trees and restoring the utility poles and wiring required coordinated, concentrated, multidisciplinary team efforts. By Saturday, August 22nd, we resumed yeah. service to the final segment of the Harlem line between Golden's Bridge and Southeast after crews completed repairs to utility poles, tracks, and other infrastructure. The storm was a challenge for the region, and the effects of our workforce were nothing short of amazing for clearing trees and making repairs. And I commend our employees for a job well done, and I want to thank our customers for their patience during this time period. Despite the challenges of Hurricane, or sorry, excuse me, Tropical Storm Isaias, service delivery remained high during the month of August, uh, with trains operating above goal at 95.7%, and our year-to-date performance 3.2% better than in 2019. Um, meanwhile, west of Hudson service operated below goal at 91.0, but year-to-date performance stands at 94.8%. From a ridership perspective, we've seen a slight increase in ridership, and we are now carrying approximately 22% of our normal weekday ridership, which is a 3 to 4% increase since the last week of August, and we're carrying roughly between 40 and 43% of our weekday, uh, sorry, weekend ridership, while providing roughly 62% of our normal train service. Now, a brief update on positive train control and our progress towards that federally mandated pro uh, project. In mid-August, we implemented mandated wayside PTC, inter uh, sorry, PTC operability on our entire system east of the Hudson River. Um, thanks to a lot of hard work, we achieved this major milestone on 100% of our tracks, and we remain on schedule to have full PTC functionality across the entire railroad by the end of this year. All of our diesel trains and all of our electric trains on the Harlem and the Hudson lines are operating in full PTC. And we're now working on upgrading our M8 electric cars, which ride on the New Haven line, and it will allow those electric trains to enter PTC operations in October. 
I want to congratulate our team for achieving these milestones and uh, you know we're going to keep the momentum going to get us there through the end of this year. Um, a bit of good news yesterday from our friends west of Hudson. I had a call from Kevin Corbett last night. Um, the uh, Pascack Valley line has been approved to enter ERSD and it's expected to happen uh, you know, as early as today. So that's good news from the west of Hudson. Uh, with respect to COVID, um, as Pat Warren mentioned earlier on in the meeting, we're doing all that we can to keep our system clean and safe. Uh, and we have several initiatives underway to further enhance our cleaning methods. Um, I'm pleased to announce that in partnership with Kenora Merak, we're going to be the first railroad in North America to begin field testing of their patented three-stage air filtration and purification system for rolling stock, which includes the use of renewable products. Next week, we're going to be begin we're going to begin testing on an M7 train set for the next 60 days, and we'll also evaluate using this technology on our entire fleet. Other projects continue to go ahead across the territory as we advance important infrastructure work. Earlier this month, we completed the reconstruction of the 6th Avenue Bridge in downtown Mount Vernon one month ahead of schedule. The new bridge is now open for pedestrians and vehicular traffic to safely cross, uh, cross the bridge over our New Haven line tracks. The completion of this bridge is a symbol of our commitment to the people and the city of Mount Vernon to have a safe bridge that serves as an artery to get people downtown. Uh, we are now turning our attention to two other bridges that are underway. Um, the 10th Avenue Bridge is being rebuilt and is expected to open next summer. And construction began on the 3rd Avenue Bridge back in April, and this is also expected to be uh, uh, reopened next summer. Uh, we recently cut over our new power substation at Riverdale, which was one of our post Sandy projects. And our hardworking crews have also been busy enhancing the Green Lane grade crossing in Bedford with new concrete pads. And we've begun installing delineators at all public grade crossings and that will be completed by next year. We also successfully replaced the four track switches directly south of the Scarsdale station in less time than originally planned, resulting in less impact on train service because of our reduced ridership. This improvement will increase the reliability of our Harlem line train service. Uh, Metro North MW crews also upgraded our infrastructure by replacing 18,000 railroad ties on the New Haven line, 14,000 on the Danbury branch and 8,000 on the Waterbury branch. Finally, uh, Rail Safety Week. As we mark Rail Safety Week in the US, we are doing our part to raise awareness of the need for rail safety education and to empower the public to keep themselves safe near the railroad. To coincide with National Rail Safety Week, we're launching our third annual rail safety poster contest that asks students from grades pre-K to 12 to create posters illustrating what they believe is most important about rail safety. Today, Customer Safety Day is being observed in Grand Central and features our, uh, our mascot, Metro Man, handing out masks to customers who need them. And this coming Friday, we are participating in operated hash, Operation Hashtag Red Out for rail safety by wearing red shirts to remind everyone to think safety first near all tracks, trains, and at stations, plat station platforms. Finally, uh, yesterday we announced an update to our Metro North train time app that now features a real time train ta tracking map integrated into the app, a one tap link to view, view and purchase tickets via MTA eTix, and the ability to bookmark favorite trips and stations. In addition, our customers can now use the app in languages other than English. Uh, it's the five most prevalent languages in Metro North Territory, which are Chinese, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Yiddish. This, uh, these updates enhance the customer experience and address the needs of our riders as they come back to our system. I wanna thank our in-house staff and our uh, supporting IT experts from the MTA IT department who continue to innovate and find ways to make commuting safer and more reliable for our customers. Uh, these folks are also working on another update for probably the month of October uh, that will provide similar fun functionality to what's currently in place on the Long Island to provide passenger counts on each car, which allow riders to more efficiently social distance on our trains. Finally, that concludes my report, and I have one action item for the board's consideration and approval, requesting board approval to enter into a contract to accept up to $500,000 in congestion mitigation air quality. This is a CMAC grant from the New York State Department of Transportation. This improves access to Metro North stations and covers the period from October 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2021. I submit this action item to the board for approval. Uh, thank you, Kathy. I'll make a motion to approve. Any any questions on this item? Uh, do I have a second? I'll I second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Uh, the item carries. Thank you. Kathy, back to you. Okay. 
There are two competitive procure procurements in this month's package, which total $12.8 million. The competitive procurements are as follows. First, approval is requested for a contract modification in the not to exceed amount of $7.8 million to the existing miscellaneous service contracts for as needed emergency and scheduled bus services that was awarded to six contractors. Approximately 80% of the as needed busing, emergency and scheduled busing will take place in the state of Connecticut and CDOT reimburses 100% of the costs in connection with bus service on our, the branch lines in Connecticut, the New Haven, I'm sorry, the New Canaan, the Danbury and the Waterbury. Uh, the second procurement uh, approval is requested for a contract modification to an existing contract for a 20 month time extension and additional funding in the not to exceed amount of $5 million. This contract modification is needed to replace the existing utility poles uh, beyond repair to permit the installation of new communications and signals cables as part of the Harlem Line Express cable contract. I submit both these procurements to the board for approval. Uh, thank you, Kathy. I'll make the motion to approve. Any questions on this? Uh, do I have a second? I second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Uh, thank you. The procurements uh, carry. Uh, turn it over to Phil Ng uh, for a report on the Long Island Railroad. Phil. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, everyone. I'm proud to announce that just yesterday we've again been recognized by APTA as the recipient of their 2020 Safety and Security Gold Award. It's their top honor recognizing our industry leading safety initiatives at our grade crossings including our partnership with Waze, which just launched globally, and our reflectorized delineators at all of our 294 crossings. This is the fifth time that the railroad has been recognized with this achievement since after began the award in 2013. And it's indicative of what I set out to do when I joined the railroad in 2018. I challenge our teams to think outside the box to solve persistent problems. And this is just one of the many innovative solutions that have garnered worldwide attention, being first in class and leading the way. And speaking of safety, I want to let the public know that we're continuing to welcome back riders to the system, and I want to assure them that it's safe to ride. We're continuing our robust cleaning and disinfecting protocols at a rate never seen before in railroad history. Our customer ambassadors are out at stations and on platforms, handing out masks to customers, as well as hand sanitizer. This morning, I joined them in Ronkonkoma. With me was Jeremy Bringman, chair of the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council, FRA, MTAPD, and Laurie Ebenhausen, VP of Corporate Safety, as we highlighted National Rail Safety Week. I'm also pleased to report that I saw strong mass compliance and new riders returning for the first time this morning. This is showing in our figures as well, as we continue to see growth in our ridership. We're seeing um, our weekend ridership at 50% of normal levels and our weekday ridership at 27% of our normal levels. Current riders have told me that they do feel comfortable on the train and they do trust the railroad to get them to where they need to go back and forth safely and reliably. And we welcome each and every customer back. In June, we launched a newly revamped train time app that shows customers which car they can enter that has the least amount of people on a particular train, information that's loaded and given to them in real time. And earlier this month, we added this real time loading feature on our diesel fleet. Now 100% of our fleet is outfitted with this technology. It's available in the palm of your hands. And then earlier this month, in addition, we added another invaluable feature to help customers plan their trips before they even leave their homes. The historical loadway tool, which updates daily, shows how heavy or light the ridership was on a particular train over the last week. I'm proud of the strides we continue to make to improve the customer experience, especially amid this pandemic. All of these positives would not be possible without the smart and dedication of our workforce. And I thank them for everything they do on a daily basis to keep New York running as we look to rebuild our economy. I'd also like to thank our customers who not only choose to ride with us, but also the overwhelming majority who are following the health advice of our rules for wearing masks on public transit. This simple task is helping us to keep everyone, our customers, our employees safe, and it goes a long way to getting New York back on track. And last but not least, the MTA police deserve a big thank you for stepping up enforcement on trains and helping us hand out masks and reminding customers that they are mandatory on trains and stations. We want customers to know that we'd much rather hand out masks than hand out fines. The fines are a last resort, and I'm happy to see practically universal mask compliance aboard the trains each day on my commute. In August, our on-time performance was 93.3%. Tropical storm Isaias brought more damage and downed trees across our system than Superstorm Sandy did, but thanks to our dedicated workforce, we recovered with full service up and running less than 48 hours after the storm first hit. 
It's a true testament to the Long Island Railroad teams who rise to every, every challenge, getting the job done no matter what the circumstance. Regarding projects, our workforce has continued vital in-house state of good repair work over the past month, including the completion of concrete tie insulation on Port Washington Branch between Harold and Shea, and now we're installing concrete tires on the main line between Divide and Nassau 3 in parallel with the ongoing Nassau 3 switch replacement. And regarding positive train control, I'm pleased to say we're still on track to meet the deadline by the end of this year. There's more details on all of these efforts and they're in the book. In closing, I'd like to thank all of our employees, all of the essential employees throughout our region and all of our riders as we jointly make strides in this fight against the pandemic. That concludes my remarks. Um, there are three procurements this month, totaling approximately $8.1 million. The first is an amendment to previously board approved multi-agency purchase contracts to add funding in the amount of $2.5 million for Placer American Corporation for replacement parts, equipment upgrades, and troubleshooting repair services on vital track work equipment. The second is a contract modification in the amount of $1.948,569 to Nouveau Electric Industries for one additional year to continue to provide rehab work, schedule preventive maintenance, remedial and schedule repairs and emergency on-call repairs of 115 Long Island Railroad elevators. And then the third is a joint procurement on behalf of Long Island Railroad and Metro North uh, for a one-year contract modification, not to exceed the amount of $3,680,632 um, uh, to Nouveau, um, to, to Nouveau Elect Elevator Industries as well. Um, again, this is for preventive maintenance repair services to 28 Long Island Railroad escalators and 14 Metro North escalators. I submit these procurements for board approval. Uh, thank you. I'll make the motion to approve. Any questions for Phil on these procurements? Uh, Pat, it's Kevin. It's, uh, I'll second. Thank you, Kevin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed Aye. or abstentions? The procurements carry. Uh, Jano. Apologies in advance for uh, the, the long rhetoric, but uh, it's required by process. Um, construction and development has three procurement actions totaling $76.9 million that are brought through the Joint Railroad Committee for approval this month. There are no non-competitive items. There are two competitive actions totaling $73.53 million. The first action is for the award of competitively solicited design-build contract for the installation of track, special track, contact rail and electric traction catenary for the east side access project in the amount of $66.275 million. The second action is for the award of a contract mod to the east side access tunnel signal and systems installation contract to accelerate the installation and local testing of signal equipment to align with the scheduled start of IST, integrated systems testing. The total amount of this modification is $7.26 million. There's one ratification this month for a modification to the east side access Harold Structures and Tunnel BC Tunnel Approach contract to advance the construction of a portion of the eastbound reroute approach structure in the amount of $3.4 million. I submit these three procurement items to the board for approval. Uh, thanks, Jan. I'll make the motion to approve these procurements. Uh, any questions? Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, thank you. Hey, Pat. Kevin, you're uh, going to hey, recuse Pat. on Comstock and Huglin. Uh, yeah, uh, it's Kevin. Uh, I need to recuse myself on the first item as one of the co-venture partners is a member of the LIA. Uh, thank you. Uh, duly noted. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Law abstains. Jano. Uh, C&D also has two procurement actions for approval totaling $8.1 million that are brought through the Transit Committee this month. Both of these items are ratifications. The first is for a mod to a contract for the installation of three elevators at the 59th Street Station on the 4th Avenue line in Brooklyn to provide accessibility upgrades at the Avenue Station in the amount of $6.4 million, which includes a quarter million dollars of scaled incentives if the contractor completes the work ahead of schedule. This mod will take advantage of the current low ridership levels to accelerate customer access, customer access to a fully ADA compliant station. The second item is for a mod to the contract for the installation of CBTC on the QBL 
for the acceleration of work associated with the installation of the data communication system equipment and CBTC train uh, equipment for a total of $1.7 million. That includes $400,000 of incentives if the contractor completes work on schedule. I submit these two procurement items to the board for approval. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Jano. I'll make the motion to approve. Do we have any questions on these? Uh, I'll take a second. I second that. Uh, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Uh, procurement carries. Back to you, Jano. Finally, C&D has one procurement action for approval totaling $928,000 that is brought through the Finance Committee this month. This item is for the ratification of a contra contract mod to dismantle this is actually a, an interesting one. Dismantle an existing <laughs> prototype semi-automatic robot, which we acquired after the Genius Challenge highlighted this opportunity, and to retrofit it for use in subway tunnels to expedite the installation of cable management systems within subway tunnels. The robot will be capable of drilling at, uh, at speed and will also collect silica dust uh, generated by the drilling operation. I submit this procurement item to the board for approval. Uh, thank you, John. I'll make the motion to approve. Any uh, questions? Second. I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed or abstentions? Procurement carries. Thank you, uh, Jano. Uh, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first of all, just a couple of, um, of items I wanted to go over. I'll start with the derailment. I know uh, it's been discussed by a couple of other folks already this morning, but I just want to add a couple of um, thoughts on it. So as everyone is now well aware, just after 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, a northbound A train derailed uh, at the 14th Street, 8th Avenue uh, station uh, after hitting debris that had been placed on the tracks. We are incredibly grateful there were no serious injuries in the incident. I want to thank the New York City Transit team and the NYPD for their incredible work following Sunday's derailment. A few hours following the derailment, we were able to restart local service but bypassing the station and then incredibly able to have regular service back by the Monday morning rush. To be clear, that required our teams to make significant repairs to the track bed, third rail, tracks, and signals. Uh, working throughout the entire day on Sunday uh, and, com and working overnight on Sunday night and into Monday morning. It's hard to describe what, it, what an incredible feat that is. Um, it's remarkable and, and it's certainly not to be critical of any other system, but honestly I'm not sure that other systems would be able to get that up and running that quickly. It was just an, it was an unbelievable accomplishment. Um, as I said to, to many of the folks who worked on it yesterday, um, it was incredible work, but I think it was also an important reminder at this moment in particular <coughs> that, um, you know, once again, public servants really rise to the occasion and get us through our, our moments of crisis. It was a, it was a good day for government on, on Monday. Um, and, you know, I also want to acknowledge the Good Samaritan who was in the station, who happened to be in the station on Sunday morning, who leapt into action. Uh, Rakeen Wilder first cleared the tracks of debris, then alerted MTA personnel to what was happening on the tracks, and then following the derailment actually held the, the person who's believed to have caused the derailment until the police arrived. So I know we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do more on him later, but, but so grateful to him and his quick work. Um, the specific circumstances around the derailment were, were troubling, but unfortunately not particularly unique, particularly uh, over the last year or so. As our workforce knows all too well, and as this board knows, we've seen a troubling increase in worker assaults, vandalism, and other problematic incidents in our system. Um, you know, it, our system is so vast. We have such a huge workforce, so many riders, even at this moment where ridership is is down significantly. It's hard to know on a daily basis everything and understand everything that's happening in our vast system. Uh, and the data uh, that is publicly um, released and publicly available often does not tell the full story about what's happening in our system. And so, um, you know, over the last couple of months, uh, starting over the summer, I had directed members of the transit team to 
um, start pulling on those different threads of data, both the data that you know we create because we know about incidents that are happening in our system, but also the data that's produced by the NYPD and others, and put them put all of that data in one place. Uh, that data is shared with me each week, um, and I find it very helpful. It's each morning, actually, and each week, and I find it very helpful um, to understand uh, what's happening in the system uh, on a, almost an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Um, and I, it's been very useful to me, and I think it'll be useful uh, to the board as well. We are going to start sharing that information um, publicly on our website. It's not perfect yet, that the data is not, the data stream is not perfect yet, the weekly report is not perfect yet, um, but we improve it every week and I think it, it will be a useful window into, um, into our system uh, for everyone. I also want to turn briefly to the one, to our 179s. Feels like a lifetime ago, but <laughs> as you will remember earlier this summer, we took the R-179 fleet out of service following a third serious issue that came up with those cars. Uh, we then pulled together a panel of outside experts uh, led uh, by our panel chair, Robert Lobby, uh, who's the, um, associate, who was the former associate administrator for safety at the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, that panel uh, came together earlier this summer and um, did a huge amount of work over the summer. Um, they met regularly, I want to say more than a dozen times. We shared with them every document, every piece of information that we could and that they were interested in. We made our teams uh, completely available to them. Uh, I know Bombardier was, was very cooperative as well. So I want to, th they're, they're doing their work in two phases. Uh, phase one is an assessment of what went wrong and recommendations for how to get the cars back into service. Uh, the second phase will happen, um, will, will, will begin now. The first phase has been completed. The second phase will now start. Um, the second phase will help us um, understand lessons learned from this event and give us um, recommendations for um, how to better um, assure quality in um, future car procurements. But the first phase of their work is done, and they have um, produced a report uh, that basically um, looks at um, what happened over the last couple of years with these incidents and makes recommendations for how to get the cars back into service. Um, to the board, we've shared that report with you. Um, it was not in the board materials because there's no action to take and because it, ca it, it was completed after the board materials were finalized, but we have um, at least shared that report with the Transit Committee. I'll share it with all of you and we're also happy to make it um, available to the public. Um, the, the summary of the report is as follows. Uh, basically, the panel agrees that the three incidents that led us to this point were, were very serious ones, uh, but that they were dealt with appropriately by New York City Transit. More importantly, this report stipulates that, the, um, that, the, that New York City Transit has done good work to attempt to predict and see if any future issues could arise that we could uh, predict, see coming, and, and address on the front end. Um, the panel also makes recommendations for reintroducing the fleet, which we are following um, to a T. Again, you can, you can see more detail in the report, but at a high level, basically, we're going to be working closely with Bombardier on software and firmware updates, uh, directing Bombardier to coordinate closely with us on all of those updates going forward. We're placing each one's R179 into non-revenue service for testing, keeping a close watch for any and all failures or issues that come up and as they appear immediately in uh, addressing them in close coordination with the panel and Bombardier, and assuming no failures or issues uh, while the cars are in non-revenue service, placing the cars back into service while monitoring closely. Um, again, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions on details, um, and, uh, but more details can be found in the report. And then just a couple other quick items. Um, I would add briefly, Mr. Chairman, over the last couple of months, I've been trying to make regular visits out in the system to meet with employees. This is something I would have done in March, April, May, June, when anyone takes um, a new job, and obviously it was not something that I was able to do then, but have been able to do it on a regular basis over the last couple of months. I've also been having town hall meetings with our employees every other week. Um, we've, we've found a way to um, do basically town hall meetings with about 200, 250 employees at a time, um, and, and that's been a good way to sort of, over time, reach thousands of employees. Um, 
And I'm just constantly impressed um, of, by the caliber, the expertise, and the dedication of our teams on both buses and subways and here at headquarters. And um, it's, it's a joy to be with them every week and the highlight of my week to be with them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Feinberg. Any uh, questions? Uh, on, I, on I have one, Pat. Andrew. Uh, yes, uh, Sarah, um, I understand if you can't, if you'd rather talk offline, but um, in the case of the 14th Street derailment, do you know um, if the materials that the perpetrator used to cause the derailment um, were, were left in the station or were obtained between stations? They were in a, they were in a, uh, they were in an area of New York City Transit property where uh, no one other than New York City Transit uh, personnel should have been. Oh, okay. So that, that's, a, that's another reason to get that, uh, that anti-intrusion device uh, installed in the tunnels, obviously, that we've been hearing about for so long. Thank you. A agreed. Yeah. Sir, you've got a preferred. Yep. Answer. Yep. If no other questions, sure. Uh, the New York City Transit Procurement Package includes two items for an estimated amount of $20.9 million. The first item is a modification to a contract with Sion Design in order to provide a 15-month extension for continued maintenance and video data management services to the bus camera security systems in the amount of four million eight hundred and thirty six thousand nine hundred and nine dollars the second item also a modification to an existing contract is with harsco Met metro rail for the exercise of an option to purchase 27 r252 flat cars and related non-car items for new york city transit department of subways in the estimated amount of sixteen million fifty three thousand three hundred and ninety six I submit these procurements for board approval uh, thank you sir i'll make a motion to approve uh, these procurements any questions no. Uh, I'll, I'll take I a second. second. I'll take a second. I second, Pat. Thank you. And I also want to thank um, Sarah and the hardworking members of the Transit Authority for getting us back up and running on in time for Monday morning's rush. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. A a amen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? The procurements carry. Thank you, sir. Uh, Danny, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not I'm, Pat, I'm not surprised that they got it back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Randy. You're, you're right. Uh, Danny, uh, report on bridges and tunnels, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to note two significant customer-facing bridge and tunnel improvements that began last week. First, MTA construction and development started an important new phase of the Drogneck Bridge roadway replacement project. Using a movable barrier, bridges and tunnels will be able to maintain full peak direction lane capacity while the bridge's more than 60-year-old concrete roadway decks are replaced. The second customer improvement in partnership with MTA Bus was the restoration of the third Brooklyn-bound lane for afternoon rush hour customers at the UL Carry Tunnel. This rush hour conf uh, tunnel configuration had been suspended due to COVID-19, but with traffic levels in this area increasing, the need to restart this customer travel enhancement was identified which will reduce travel times for MTA bus customers and other motorists leaving Lower Manhattan. Other bridge and tunnel facilities are also experiencing increasing traffic levels. In July, bridge and tunnel paid traffic was 19% lower than last year's level, continuing the recovery from the 65% year over year decline back in April. And preliminary figures for August indicate that bridge and tunnel traffic declined by 17% compared to the previous year. I would like to thank all Bridge and Tunnel personnel for their outstanding efforts and continued dedication that have enabled us to safely meet our customer needs throughout these challenging times. As we, we have recently passed the 19th anniversary of September 11th terrorist attacks, it is especially appropriate to salute our emergency response and other frontline workers who safeguard the traveling public every day. We are committed to making every effort to provide safeguards to help them continue to perform their essential duties and to protect their families. And finally, Mr. Chairman, uh, there are no bridge and tunnel procurements this month. That concludes my report. Uh, thank you, Danny. Any questions for Danny? Okay, thank you. Uh, turning next to the Finance Committee, Chief Procurement Officer Kavesh Ayer will present the procurement package. Kavesh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. MTA headquarters has four competitive procurement actions totaling 
1,637. The first action proposed is the multi-agency procurement for the supply and distribution of uniform garments. Awards will be made to four firms, Unipro International, VF Imagewear, 7th Avenue Trade Apparel, and Tyndale USA, totaling 54,975,771. Or for five years with two additional 18 month options. The next action is an award to Metropolitan Life Insurance Company to provide life, accidental death and dismemberment, long-term and short-term disability benefits insurance. This action totals 55,511,837 for the three-year duration with two one-year options. The third action proposed is the award for dental benefits for bargained and non-bargained active employees retirees and their dependents. Awards will be made to two firms, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company and HealthPlex, totaling 158,718,000 for three years with two one-year options. The last action proposed is a modification to extend a contract with Masabi LLC to continue providing support for Long Island Railroad and Metro North's mobile ticketing program while the agencies transition to Omni. This extension totals $10,285,029 for a period of 34 months. There are no comparative actions nor ratifications proposed this month, and this concludes headquarters procurements. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavesh. I'll make a motion to approve these uh, procurements. Uh, do we have any questions? Second, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I, I, was that a second? Okay, thank you. Uh, no questions. Yeah. We're going to vote on these uh, separately. So can I have a second on all four items? Mr. Schwartz, you've done that. Yes. Okay, f first we'll vote on the action item for the four awards for the supply and distribution of uniform garments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. Opposed, Aye. any opposed or abstentions? That carries. Second, we'll vote on the award to MetLife to provide life, accidental, death, and dismemberment, long-term and short-term disability benefits insurance. All in favor? I, uh, any Aye. opposed? Uh, Commissioners Lacewell and Khaleesi will uh, recuse, and let's have the uh, record uh, indicate that. Uh, procurement carries. Third, uh, we'll vote on the award to MetLife and HealthPlex for dental benefits for bargained and non-bargained active employees, retirees, and their uh, dependents. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Uh, again, Commissioners Lacewell and Khaleesi will uh, recuse, and the minutes will reflect that. Uh, the procurement carries. Finally, we will vote on the modification to Masabi LLC's contract to continue providing support for the Long Island Railroad and Metro North Mobile Ticketing Program. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? The procurement carries. Uh, over to David Florio to uh, introduce the real estate items. David. David? I don't hear anything. Uh, is he talking? I don't hear it. No, uh, we're, we're not hearing. Uh, uh, David, if you're speaking, you're muted. Uh, Annie, can you reach out to David, please, and prompt him? Why don't we move on to the uh, diversity committee items. We'll come back to uh, uh, real estate. Uh, Michael Gardner, please. Michael? Ah, Michael. Uh, you're up. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm going to give you a brief um, summation of our MWDB results. But first, let me just speak of the theme that I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak about this morning, that even during a crisis and a storm, there are still opportunities. And I'm, say, I'm saying that to say this, that during COVID-19, we have spent $230 million buying COVID-19 equipment and services 77 million of that, or 
went to New York State certified MWBE firms. In addition, uh, $118 million went to our certified minority IT providers um, in the discretionary that we went back to Albany this uh, session and got our, our discretionary threshold increased to $1 million. The other 96 agencies and state authorities in the state of New York's a discretionary threshold is 500,000. We, we needed to go and we went back and now we are awarding a record number of contracts to minority women-owned firms using this uh, vehicle. Also, um, investment banking. 58% of fees paid to our investment bankers went to certified minority women-owned investment bankers. Asset fund managers. More than $1 billion of um, um, assets are being managed by certified minority women-owned asset fund managers. So even during a crisis and a storm, the MTA is moving uh, towards inclusion. Let me just give you a quick overview of um, our initiatives. Summary of, of, of outreach events um, has resulted in 280 certified minority women-owned firms uh, getting 6.1 million in awards and 5.7 in payments uh, during this current fiscal year. Certification, 18 new firms were, uh, were uh, certified, I'm sorry, 21 firms were certified uh, doing this. It's a downward trend because of the COVID-19. Um, EEO activities, we have 72.4, uh, 72,000 employees of which 13,000 or 18% are females, 50,000 or 70% are minorities, and 2,000 or 3% are veterans. Small business program update. And you know and you understand that our small business mentoring program expired last year, and the governor extended this program for the next uh, 10 years. Uh, the results of the first 10 years were out, out, um, astounding. 436 contracts being awarded for $448 million. That's the Small Business Mentoring Program. And we're working with Jano and his team to make sure that we are maximizing the amount of contracts that's going to be awarded out of that program since it uh, has been extended by the governor for the next 10 years. Um, the MWDBE contract compliance. Uh, our current DBE goal is 18%, but a great thing is happening. Uh, the FDA requires us to, um, to forecast what our next DBE goal is going to be over the next three years. And so we did a, a, a astounding um, analysis of the type of projects that we're going to be awarding. And we uh, are going to recommend to the FTA that our 18% DBE goal is going to be increased to 20%. Uh, for the next three years. Uh, that summary is, is required by us and will be submitted to the FTA uh, by October 1st. That means more opportunities for our uh, certified DBEs. Let me talk about that we are, we are currently ranked number one in the state of New York with dollars paid to minority and, and uh, certified owned firms by far. Uh, the, the, uh, the governor is going to announce his MWBE uh, results at the state's MWBE conference in December of 2020 of this year. I can say this, that last year we, we paid $736 million to minority women-owned firms um, in one year. We were ranked first. I can tell you without telling you the, the results that we have uh, increased uh, payments to minority women-owned firms for the most uh, recently a completed fiscal year by far. I sent a, 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 um, a, a email last night to Chairman Foy uh, due to, to the leadership of Tom Quigley and his team. For the first time in history, black, Hispanic, and Asian law firms are, are now getting assignments and, and, and receiving payments uh, from the, the, the MTA. Last year, the MTA uh, spent $40 million in legal fees. 9.9 uh, .9 million of that went to certified minority women-owned firms for 19.6%. 
we are not going to rest upon our laurels until in that area we are achieving the governor's 30 percent goal and so we're going to be working in tandem with with, with uh tom and his team to make that a uh, a, a reality um let me just give you briefly some re results so we cranes cranes did a a a, a article that says that 42% of black, Asian, and Hispanic owned businesses will be out of business by 1231 of this year based upon COVID-19, unless they have access to contracts. And so let me just give you a quick data point of payments that we have paid to each one of these groups uh, last year. More than $100 million were paid to black owned businesses. More than $200 million were paid to Hispanic or Latinx businesses. More than $60 million was paid to, a, to Asian American businesses. More than $235 million was paid to uh, Eastern Indian businesses. And more than $300 million was paid to women-owned businesses last year at the MTA, ranked number one. That's my summary. There's one um, action item, uh, Chair, Chairman Foy. Uh, we are going to submit our title uh, six uh, program to the FTA, and we need that program to be ratified and approved by this board. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. I'll make the motion to approve the item. Are there any questions from Michael on either this item or any part of his presentation? Um, Mr. Chair, it's Linda Lay, so I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, Michael, to you and your team, I just want to express appreciation for the energy and passion and effectiveness that you bring to the table every day uh, to make a difference. It's more important than ever to make sure that uh, uh, black and other minority uh, communities are fully participating on at least a proportionate basis in the contracts and the economic opportunities that uh, we can provide. So just thank you for that. Let me also thank you also as well for your, your leadership and support and the support of Chairman Foy and the whole entire board, but also leading by example because the governor of the Great Empire State has led by example. New York State has the most effective MWBE program in the nation and is getting better. So thank you for your leadership as well. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, do I have a second to approve the Title VI report? I second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, thank you. The item carries. Uh, let's go back to real estate items. And uh, David Florio, uh, back to you. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Very good. Sir, we have uh, 12 action items for consideration and approval. Metro has three items. Two of them are modifications to existing board policies governing the licensing for retail and events in the terminal. These are intended to give real estate um, greater flexibility addressing the challenges posed by COVID-19's impacts. The third is a license agreement with Chappaqua Transportation for use of vacant land in Chappaqua. The Long Island Railroad has eight action items. Five are agreements with taxi operators for provision of services at Huntington, Bayshore, Babylon, Sable, and Hicksville stations. And the sixth for Long Island Railroad is acquisition of a warehouse in support of the mainland expansion uh, uh, project as part of the great elimination uh, effort in that area. The seventh item is in a license agreement with the Dwarf Associates for access uh, and customer employee parking on the Montauk branch right away in Queens. The last item uh, for Long Island Railroad is a change order to the contract associated with the Penn Station Level 8 concourse improvements. And there is one MTA item that is for the MTA Police Department. It is a lease agreement with 1825 Park Avenue Property Investors LLC for office space at 1825 Park Avenue in support of MTA PD um, facilities in that area. Uh, there are also four additional uh, information items. Happy to ask answer any questions uh, the board may have. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Uh, any questions? I'll make the motion to approve. Any questions for David on any of these? Uh, can I have a second? Second. Uh, all in second. favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Thank you. The real estate uh, items uh, carry. Uh, unless there's any uh, other business, uh, I'm going to take a motion to adjourn. I move Pat, it. Pat. Randy. Can I have one? Randy. Yeah, uh, thank you for sending out the um, the reminder about the census, given the climate in Washington. Many of the speakers today have talked about it. 
it's important that uh, everybody, if they haven't already done it, do the census because every dollar counts. So thank you. Thank you for that reminder. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Uh, the meeting Aye. is adjourned. Th thank you all. Uh, Pat Foy, I'm joined today by my colleague Sarah Feinberg and honored to be joined by a legitimate, genuine New York hero, Raikeen Wilder, who is to my, uh, to my right. Uh, Raikeen Wilder is the gentleman who acted heroically on uh, Sunday uh, at the 14th Street uh, station. Uh, he went down onto the tracks, removed material at great peril to himself, removed material, uh, may have saved the lives of dozens of New Yorkers, including New York City Transit uh, crew, and that wasn't enough uh, day's work for Mr. Wilder. Then he, after the uh, uh, perpetrator of this uh, incredibly dangerous uh, action uh, did it a second time, Mr. Wilder apprehended uh, the uh, perpetrator, held him until the police arrived, and uh, it's an extraordinary story of New York uh, heroism and New York uh, uh, tough. Uh, Sarah and I are here to applaud his, uh, his, his work. Uh, normally, we don't uh, encourage uh, riders, customers to go down onto the tracks, uh, but in this case, Mr. Wilder did it at great peril to uh, himself and in the interest of protecting lives of uh, New Yorkers, uh, customers, fellow customers, and, uh, and, and our employees. Extraordinary. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and then we'll have a presentation to make. Thanks, Pat. Raikeen, I want to start off by thanking you for your bravery. You're uh, on behalf of all of us at New York City Transit, uh, what you did for your fellow New Yorkers was astonishing. On Sunday, as Pat just said, Raikeen was at the 14th Street, AC, 14th Street ACE station when he saw this perpetrator uh, placing debris on the tracks. Without a second thought, he ran down to remove it just before a train passed safely through, uh, then went to notify MTA personnel. When Raikeen returned to the platform, he saw the same person doing it again, uh, which, as we all know now, caused a northbound A train to derail. Uh, to stop him from getting away, Raikeen then chased the man to the station mezzanine and held him until police arrived. Uh, as Pat said last night in a statement, I think that makes him a hero three times over. Um, as Pat said, without your quick thinking, this derailment could have been much worse and the perpetrator may not have been apprehended. Uh, so this was remarkable. You're clearly a hero of the subway. We don't say that lightly, and we'd like to start by giving you this placard to honor your efforts here of the subway. And my colleague Sarah Meyer is going to also has a New York Tough t-shirt for you and a New York Tough mask for you. I don't know if you're a Mets fan. It's okay if you're not, but we uh, the Mets gave us those masks and we love them and and um, and we're so grateful to you. Thank you. I'll turn it back over. Turn it back over to Pat. Thank you. And then in an MTA first, given the extraordinary heroism today, we're going to extend the highest award the MTA can provide to a civilian. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and here it is. It is a year of unlimited rides, uh, MetroCard. Uh, we will be providing one that will actually fit through the, uh, exactly, uh, through, through, through the turnstile. So I, I'm going to present that to you. I'm going to invite you to the podium, and if you just would talk for a couple of minutes about uh, your extraordinary work on Sunday, that would be great. Um, I don't know where to start. Um, Rain, I, you I, want to take the I never really yeah. considered myself a hero. Um, as a child, you know, my mother always encouraged me to kind of look out for people in the neighborhood, and, you know, kids at school. So it was kind of a natural thing um, for me to respond to, you know, the guy in the subway like I did. Um, it kind of angered me a little bit because he seemed to get some joy out of, you know, um, wrecking the train and potentially harming people. So I took it upon myself to, to, to apprehend um, the gentleman, well, not the gentleman, the, the perpetrator or the weirdo or whatever you want to call him. Um, <laughs> when we got into a physical altercation, um, he tried to flee and um, 
you know, I, I put him in a chokehold and I threatened to break his arm. Um, and I held, I held him for 15 minutes and, and um, because of that, I sprained, I sprained my wrist. Um, it's kind of hard holding someone for 15 whole minutes at full, you know, uh, grip. But um, I like to thank um, the NYPD. Um, they were very professional. Um, and their response as well as the New York City Fire Department, um, you know, um, they displayed professionalism um, beyond what I can explain. Um, you know, NYPD always gets a bad name for what, you know, in the media, but I, I just want to tell the people that um, all the police that were on the scene, they were professionals and they responded um, in the best manner um, they could possibly do so. So um, I'm appreciative for everyone here at the MTA for um, recognizing me and calling me a hero. Um, I'm, I'm very overwhelmed um, and ultimately genuinely happy and grateful. So I thank, thank you all. I thank the MTA, the NYPD, um, the New York City Fire Department, and everybody in between. Thank you all. All right, if you want to stay up there, Mr. Wilder, because sure, some of the sure. press has questions for you, we're going to start with uh, Jose Martinez of the city has a question for you. Go ahead, Jose. Yeah. Jose All Martinez. Right, go ahead. There we go. One second. Uh, Mr. Wilder, uh, nice effort. Uh, what are you going to do with that big Metro card? And then... Um, in the instant that this happened, what was your first thought when you saw what was taking place? When I, when I initially seen him, you know, I was I was kind of alerted because he was kind of like, he was murmuring like weird things. And was it was early, so it was very quiet. It was only about maybe five or six people um, on the platform. So you know, it's 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 boring. You're waiting for the train, and I kept hearing this this tinging sound. So it, it kind of you're bored, so you're kind of nosy. So I walked over to the adjacent express side, um, and I looked. I just looked down, and I could see a man in the middle of the, the track. So it was a little weird at first. He was kind of like, just meandering, like he was throwing things at the at the rail. Then he started placing things on the rail. Then I started to get a little concerned. So I kind of watched him for a little while. So he then placed the things, and then he started to proceed back up, you know, to the platform from the, you know the subway tunnel. So when he came up, I kind of just went down in the area where he was and to see what he was doing. And I noticed that, you know, he had some things placed on top of the rail and beside the rail. So I removed what I could see and I got up out of there because I, you know, I can hear, I can feel that you can feel the turbulence from the train coming. Um, and then I went upstairs to alert the MTA worker. But um, it was just, you know, it was really awkward to just see a man standing. He was very close to the third rail. And it was just weird, so I was just being nosy, and then I got a little concerned when I see him, seen him placing um, things on, 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 the, uh, on the tracks. And then the second time around, it was just like, I knew he was going to do something. It was like, you know, because he was like kind of like smiling. He was, had this deranged kind of look on his face. So, you know, I was kind of yelling at him, and he really didn't respond. He was kind of looking at me. He was like waiting for like something to happen. And as soon as the, the train derailed, he was just like, you know, like a field goal, and he was just like, and then I was, I said a few words to him, and he looked at me, and he started to run, and I chased after him, kind of tackled him, we kind of had this, a small altercation, and um, he tried to make it to the, 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 um, the turnstile, and I grabbed him right before, you know, he entered to, to, to exit to the turnstile and held him there to the authorities came. All right, we've got another question now from uh, Dan Rivoli. New York one, who looks like he's ducked behind the desk. There he is. You're back, Dan Rivoli, for Mr. Wilder. All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for for being here and taking our questions. And uh, I, I mean, how are you? Can you just describe kind of what you tried to prevent the derailment? I mean, and then seeing it happen. What, what were emotions were you having? And and one, as you saw it happen, and then two, as you detained this person, the suspect, for police to arrive, um, you know, putting yourself at risk in, in both situations. The second time he the second time he showed up, I was kind of like angry, you know, because it was like for someone to kind of like um, 
to get their like some happiness out of causing like havoc and destruction um, to the utmost. It bothered me, um, and I kind of responded to it, you know, in in, in a way. Um, I, I had to do something because there were people on the platform, you know, and people were just kind of just like looking and. You know, as I was chasing him down, people were following us, you know, like it was some type of spectacle, you know, recording, but they weren't doing anything about it. But um, I felt very angry. I was disturbed. I was shocked. I was in shock, you know, like watching him smile and watching the train wreck and the fire and the smoke. It was like being on a, you know, a Hollywood set. And it was, it was like, it was like overstimulating, you know, my, my brain was in, was in terms, is this real? Is this real? So it's like, to, for me not to like, to go into a state of shock to where I'm, I'm frozen, you know, I, I just, my adrenaline kicked in and I was like, I have to do something about it because normally when something happens in New York, you know, you watch the news and the, the guy gets away and they just have some, some like dark snapshot from a camera and they never catch the guy. So, you know, I always made it my point that if I was to come across something or someone, um, I'm going to do something about it. And yeah, I did it out of, out of. Scared. I was scared, and I was I was sort of angry. All right, we've got just two more questions. First, we're going to go to Clayton Goose of the Daily News, who broke this story this morning. Clayton, hello, Clayton. Hey, Mr. Wilder. You um you spoke with our reporter Brittany Kriegstein yesterday. Um, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Where'd you grow up? And then also, you had told Brittany that you would plan uh, you would consider taking Uber or walking to your destination Sunday morning. Um, how long have you been taking the subway? Have you been taking it throughout the pandemic? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I take the subway all all the time. Um, you know, I've always enjoyed to take the subway. My uncle used to bring me to New York City, as I used to be fascinated by by the train system. Um, and I, I'm a frequent rider of of the, of the subway system. Um, I just like to also commend the MTA because uh, you know. The efforts in cleaning cleaning the trains. We have very clean trains now, and um, you know, as a proud New Yorker, that's also a thing to be uh, proud of. But um, as far as where I'm from, I'm from um, a small town, um, what New Yorkers would consider the Jersey Shore. Um, I'm from a small town called uh, Red Bank. Um, it's in Monmouth County. Um, my family's from a, a, a town that's next to it, Titten Falls. Um, it's a very small town. Went to a very small high school. Um, a very well-known college, which is Monmouth University. Um, I had a simple childhood, a mother and father. I grew up in a middle-class, uh, mixed neighborhood. And, um, you know, my parents were very hard on me um, regarding, you know, school and, you know, certain mannerisms and how you treat people in the world. So I'm very appreciative um, of the parents and the upbringing that I had for me to do something like this um, for, for all my, my fellow New Yorkers. And, um, just people in general. All right, we're going to have one last question, then some closing thoughts from Sarah Feinberg and Pat Foy. Steve Burns, WCBS 880 Radio. Steve, last question on this topic. Thanks, Tim. And, and Mr. Wilder, appreciate you again taking the time to take our questions here. I actually grew up in Middletown, just north of Red Bank, so it's good to hear that you're right from the area. Um, I know it's a kind of a delicate question because this isn't necessarily what the MTA would advise someone to do, but what was it that kind of triggered that, um, that kind of jump in your mind that said, I can't just stand around, I need to do you know, something about this? Watching, watching TV, you know, my mother, she, she prevented me from watching the news in the morning before school. Um, because of all of the, you know, the tragedies and things. And, and I always remember that, you know, you know, they would always get away, the person stealing something or the stabbing or the, the murderer or the rapist. They would, you know, they wouldn't catch the person. And, you know, and it, and it would bother me, you know. And I'm like, why? You know, you have all these people in this densely populated area. Why somebody take action? So, you know, um, as a child, I've always been a protector of my friends. Um, you know, I used to get on my friends. They used to step on bugs or like kick cats or certain things. You know, or you know, I'd say, you know, this is this is not just your planet. You know, it's all of our planet. So we have to respect it and respect each other. And um, 
these days, you know, it's a lack of respect. We humans, we're, we're losing respect for one, one another. No one, people says excuse me anymore. People don't say hello or, or good morning. It's just they just kind of snowball and they look at you and, you know, no one really appreciates life anymore. So um, I try to change that by just doing something noble, um, not only for myself, but for the people. All right, now we've got some uh, closing comments. Thanks so much for that. Sarah Feinberg and Pat Foy may want to tie this off, and then we're going to go to reporters' questions on other topics. Well, Raikeen, thank you again, and particularly for this lovely remarks. I think you might be my favorite New Yorker. <laughs> and I think I might want to call you every day to, you. To, for positive reinforcement yeah. to remember like all the folks who are using our system. And that's um, so just lovely. Thank you so much. You. Pat, do you want to? Uh, look, we're in the presence of a uh, genuine uh, New Yorker, came from out of town, and did extraordinary things on, uh, on Sunday and uh, saved the lives, uh, avoided deaths and injuries of significant number of passengers uh, and perhaps crew. There's no higher human service and we're honored to be in your presence. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Just gonna have a short pause here, folks in the Zoom room while we take some pictures and then we'll get to your questions. All right, so two things before we start questions. One, uh, I think it's important to, again, say, and Pat Warren, Chief Safety Officer, uh, reminded me that uh, customers uh, should never go down in the tracks. Uh, it's an uh, inherently dangerous place, especially for those who aren't trained and schooled in the ways of uh, uh, tracks and, uh, and third rail. So it's something that uh, nobody should do. The other thing is I, I failed today to make the following comment when we were talking about consolidation, and I don't know whether Jano's here, but, um, and I'll mention this at, at the board meeting. Uh, the consolidation of C and D uh, required moving from about 115 employees pre-consolidation to approximately 1,800 employees today, uh, 85 positions uh, in construction and development or those eligible for construction and development were eliminated through attrition. Uh, C&D maintained progress on over 500 uh, projects throughout the COVID crisis, including approximately 300 colleagues involved in construction. And amazingly, over 10 percent, uh, the number of uh, people working on construction uh, is 10, at least 10 percent higher than it was before the pandemic started in, uh, in March. I meant to mention that today. Uh, I will uh, add it to my comments in October, but I thought it was important to, uh, uh, to mention. And with that, happy to take your questions. Thanks, Pat. The first question today is going to be Marsha Kramer from CBS2 News. Marsha? Unmute. Yes, there you, go. you are unmuted. Okay. We hear you. Um, good, e good, good evening and good morning to everybody who's here. 
I guess my question, I have my questions are directed at the rules changes. It's a two part question, actually. The first part of the question has to do with the fact that many people are regarding these rules changes as directed at homeless New Yorkers and trying to prevent them from interfering with what's going on on the subways, the buses, and the trains. First part of the question is why are these rules changes so necessary now? And the second part of the question is this. Homeless advocates have um, reacted negatively to these changes, saying that especially with winter coming on, the homeless need to be able to go into the subways and trains to get warm, et cetera, and that it's criminalizing homelessness. Your reaction to both questions. Thank sure. you. The rules are targeted. Uh, the rules are targeted at, at minimizing health risk to our customers and employees, every customer in the system. Uh, that's what this was about. They were adopted and newspaper stories were written about them and Sarah Feinberg was quoted in the newspaper at the time. Uh, this was around the time of the uh, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure, which continues during the pandemic. Obviously, the rules were uh, proposed and adopted during the pandemic. And the purpose of them is to minimize health risk to our customers and our employees, period. The 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure uh, continues. It'll continue as long as the pandemic uh, c continues, and we're all hoping and praying that there isn't a, uh, a second wave, but this is all about public health. The last thing I'll say is that uh, the homeless uh, should not be sleeping on streets. They should not be sleeping in uh, subways or any other public place, and it's incumbent upon the, the city of New York and the Department of Homeless Services to provide medical and mental health and shelter to the, uh, to the unsheltered. Uh, and the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure has been an important component in allowing a significant number of the homeless to get shelter and to get service. And the next and what, question, what, what, sorry, you got to follow, Marsha, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to know what you say to the homeless advocates who say that this is criminalizing homelessness. No, it's not criminalizing homelessness uh, at all. What I'd say to the advocates, Marsha, is what I just said to you and your colleagues and, and to the public. This is about minimizing public uh, uh, public health during a pandemic in the interest of minimizing risk to customers and employees, period. Now we're gonna move on to Dave Cologne, who bizarrely appears not to be wearing a basketball shirt today, but uh, advising us that it is his day. Well, it's certainly a question. Go ahead, Dave. Street Storm is over. It's a huge bummer. And I'm sorry to uh, have to remind people of that. Um, I got a couple questions. Um, the first one, Pat, maybe uh, Craig can uh, handle this one if he's still on the call. Um, because bus speeds have dropped to around where they were pre-pandemic, um, and we're seeing that the bridge and tunnel numbers uh, that you all have been putting out, those traffic numbers have kind of rebounded even faster than the McKinsey projections had shown, uh, even as kind of the economy has totally reopened. So. Are you uh, worried at all that there's any kind of tipping point where traffic's going to overwhelm uh, buses um, and really kind of grind things to a halt? Is there anything that you think the city can or should be doing right now to prevent that kind of scenario? Uh, look, we're concerned about it. The governor has spoken about the issue. We've spoken about the issue. Uh, you're quite right that uh, in New York, as occurred in other cities in Asia and uh, Europe, uh, as the pandemic began to recede, uh, car volumes uh, increased. That's happened on uh, our, our bridges and tunnels. Uh, we are, uh, in, the subways have never been cleaner. Uh, that's been reported widely, uh, widely 70% of our customers. More importantly, New York hero, uh, Ry Keen Wilder just testified to that a couple of minutes ago before he left the genuine hero, a hero on the street uh, commentary. Uh, and uh, we, what we want to do is encourage people to ride subways and buses. Uh, come, on, come on back if you haven't been on the system uh, recently. Uh, and I think you'll find, as 70% of our customers surveyed, that the subways and buses have never been cleaner than they are now. Subway stations, subway cars, buses, same for Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Uh, and then the uh, second question I had was uh, kind of going back to what Marsha had brought up. You said that this is these new rules that have, that have been cemented now are about minimizing uh, risk, minimizing public health risk. Hey, can you talk a little bit more about is this minimizing risk that you're saying homeless New Yorkers uh, pose to riders, or is this about 
minimizing risk because you're saying that the trains have to be cleaned, uh, which is something that you know people have said you can clean the trains without kicking everybody off and without you know shutting the system down uh, every every night. So what is this risk exactly? Well, look, uh, the sanitary conditions on any uh, m mode of public conveyance is obviously a primary concern of the operator, in, in this case the MTA. The rules were proposed and have been adopted or will soon be effective to promote hygiene and to promote sanitary conditions on the subways and buses and the commuter rails, which is an item of public concern and an important issue of public health at any time, but especially dur during a pandemic. And they were adopted around the time of the uh, May 6th moving to the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure. It, it, it's, it's, a public health, uh, it's a public health issue when the rules were uh, intended, as is the 1 a.m. Uh, to 5 a.m. closure, to re minimize health risk to our customers and employees. And the next question is from Politico. Danielle Moyo standing by. Go ahead, Danielle. Hi. Um, so I wanted to, to first ask, um, I want to reflect on something that board member Bob Lynn said today, which was this idea that demand could change forever from COVID-19. I inferred him as, as possibly referencing, I guess, a change in work habits. So I guess I'm wondering, do you see that being the case? Is it affecting how you think about potential service cuts and the return of 24-hour service? And Relatedly, um, what are you projecting for the months ahead with ridership with both the return of school, but also concerns over a second wave of COVID-19? Look, on, on the second question, obviously when McKinsey did its estimates in the spring, there were lots of variables in play. That continues to be the, the, the case. Uh, New York City schools have opened in a different manner than, than, than anybody anticipated in March or April or May. The Metropolitan Opera just announced an hour or so ago that it's not going to open until September of 2021. And I, I, obviously there are New Yorkers and people who travel from outside the region in normal times to go to performances of the Met. This is a very, uh, lot, lots of variables at play. We, we, we don't control them. With respect to the first part of the question, of course, we're concerned, as are public transit operators around the country and around the world, with respect to the impact on uh, travel patterns going forward. Uh, first, my personal belief is I'm a, uh, I'm a bull on New York City. I'm bullish on New York City uh, and, and, and New York State in the intermediate and, and long term. Uh, the pandemic has exacted an incredible toll on New York from a human point of view from a social point of view, uh, from a psychological point of view, if you will, and of course from a financial point of view in terms of state, city, private businesses, large, medium-sized, and small universities, not-for-profits, et cetera. It's affected uh, everything. Uh, the thing I am most worried about from a uh, financial point of view and a operating point of view is in, uh, at the MTA, and this is true with respect to other systems around the country, the mode of transportation that has lagged the most is the commuter rails. Uh, and uh, that, is, uh, uh, that, that is of concern. Uh, obviously, the Bob Ferran went through the uh, terrible toll it's exacted, uh, the, the virus has exacted on our revenues and ridership on subways, buses, uh, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, orders of magnitude worse than the Great Depression. So we're concerned about all of it, but if I had to pick one mode that appears to be uh, at risk, and as this is not, not true just in New York, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's commuter rails uh, and the recovery and ridership there. Mm. Uh, the next question is coming in the room from your pooler. David Meyer of the New York Post. David, go ahead. Hey, is pooler a term, Tim? It is, actually. It's okay, a media it thing. He's the pooler. David. Or pool reporter. Hey, Pat, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, I'm hoping you could talk about the uh, increased uh, crime rate that was in the board books this week since we didn't have an NYPD presentation. It seems like even though crime is down, the amount of crimes per strap hanger is up. And I'm wondering if you think that might be tied to lower ridership uh, and what the MTA is doing about it. Look, it's a matter of great concern. I, I, I think that uh, 
providing a safe and secure environment for our customers at subways, buses, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, bridges and tunnels, uh, for that matter, is a, uh, is a first order uh, priority. Uh, ridership is down. Uh, crime in certain categories ha has increased. Uh, obviously, there was a uh, low level of summonses and arrest and enforcement in, uh, in August. Uh, we're in constant dialogue with the leadership of the NYPD uh, and, and, the, and the Transit Bureau. Uh, and uh, our customers would benefit from greater enforcement uh, on subways, buses, Metro North, and, uh, and Long Island Railroad. Having said that, it's important to emphasize that subways and buses are, are safe, the commuter rails are safe, uh, crime has been taken down to historic levels over a period of years. The uptick, David, that you refer to is of, uh, is of great concern and that's why we are monitoring it closely, discussing it, and Sarah Feinberg has put or will be putting additional information on the website with respect to crimes. We're especially focused on not only serious crimes, obviously, but also quality of life issues, which uh, go, A, to uh, minimizing health risks to our customers and employees during the pandemic, but also, B, to the quality of their experience. And that's one reason why we proposed and have adopted the rules that the board approved today. All right, the next question is coming from Christina Goldbaum, direct from the New York Times or from the look of it, perhaps her living room. But either way, Christina, you're up. Thanks, hi Pat. Um, I actually want to ask about crime. I mean, is there any specific ask that you guys have of the MIPD, in addition to increased enforcement, you know, more officers, whatever that might look like? And also, are you doing anything to try to convince riders that it is also safe to come back to the system, even though, again, there have been some increases in some crimes? The, the, the system is safe, both from a, a crime point of view and a public health point of view. Uh, and despite the fact that FEMA, uh, at least for now, is not funding continued cleaning of uh, uh, MTA facilities or schools, both of which is a startling, uh, uh, puzzling uh, decision, we're going to continue uh, the level, the regime of cleaning and disinfecting that we've put in place, and we're going to continue with piloting it, even if uh, FEMA is, uh, is not going to... Uh, uh, reimburse us for it, as we think we are legally entitled to and certainly entitled to as a, uh, uh, I'll use the term, as an ethical matter, right? Uh, with respect to uh, ad additional officers in the, in the subways and buses uh, would be helpful, uh, and uh, the, the level of enforcement in, in August was disappointing. Okay, and one follow-up, if I can, as well. Um, just with the uptick in COVID cases in some neighborhoods in the city and the kind of talk of a possible second wave, are you guys going to plan, planning on doing um, anything differently or, you know, adding any new precautions to help protect the transit workforce if we do have a second wave in New York? Well, Pat, Pat Warren spoke about, uh, so there's been a process uh, of lessons learned from uh, the virus that Mario and Pat Warren and Sarah and each of the agency presidents has been uh, involved in, one, two. We are looking at uh, COVID and, for, for instance, from simple things, simple important things like maximizing the number of our employees who get flu shots. That's really important. Uh, every year it's really important this year. I, I know that the Office of uh, uh, health services is already scheduling uh, flu shot opportunities uh, beginning, I think, the first week of October, and that'll continue, and that's really important. Uh, we've been talking with uh, union leaders uh, on that as well because we want to get as many people uh, vaccinated with the flu vaccine, and obviously that's an option that, uh, you know, people will be presented, and they'll make their own decision as they went to, whether they want the influenza uh, vaccine. I will tell you, I got mine last year. I got it every year, and I intend to get vaccinated when they're here, you know, in a week or two uh, at 2 Broadway or whatever facility, uh, you know, they're at. So that's, that, that's one thing. Uh, two, uh, we have sufficient stores of uh, PPE uh, to last us uh, both uh, in-house in inventory and under contracts from reputable suppliers. We're in constant contact with public uh, health officials, and we continue to pilot uh, things going to uh, ventilation, uh, issues uh, attacking uh, aerosols and uh, pursuing, uh, you know, ultraviolet and these other uh, technologies that we've spoken about. And from one national publication to another, we go to Paul Berger of the Wall Street Journal. Paul.
All right, Paul is... Uh... Oh, I think... Oh, there he is. Off the break. Break time is over. Question time has started. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, Pat. Hello, um, Paul. I have a couple of different topics. Could you just uh, clarify just a moment earlier? You said uh, regarding crime that the level of enforcement in August was disappointing. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I think if you look, uh, Paul, I direct you to the page in the uh, transit book about enforcements uh, in, in, in August. Uh, and, uh, and obviously there was a lot going on in the city uh, that month, uh, but the, uh, numbers of, uh, the numbers are down uh, across the board in August. Numbers in terms of what, summonses? Yeah, uh, sum summons summonses and other indicia of enforcement. I, 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 if, if I'm not mistaken, every one of the indicia of enforcement in August was down. Uh, actually, let me clarify that, down dramatically. Okay, and then just obviously when it comes to Long Island Railroad and Metro North, that's not the NYPD's jurisdiction. So do you feel like the commuter rails are being adequately policed? Well, look, uh, let, let me say a couple of things. One is there have been attacks on our employees at Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and New York City Transit that are completely uh, unacceptable uh, and the, you know, ser serious, uh, serious reports. Uh, that is of, uh, you know, that is of great concern. Uh, the uh, level of enforcement issue that we experienced on the subways was not replicated on, uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the commuter rails. And next question is from Steve Nesson, WNYC. Steve. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, Steve. Hi. Hi, Pat. Uh, Quick, I have two questions. One is just to clarify what Larry Schwartz said about the MT. Steve, we lost you. Running out of money in December. Steve, uh, you got to you got to start okay. over from Larry uh, Schwartz because then hello. you broke up and broke out. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about Larry Schwartz. He said the MTA will run out of money in December, uh, but I heard someone mention that was not correct. Uh, so if not December, then when? So I, I'm going to ask our CFO to. Okay. And as he said, he doesn't expect anything to change. Yep. Yep. Uh, we have the authority to issue deficit financing. And as you know, we are projecting a deficit for this year. The size of the deficit will be determined on what actions we take between now and the end of the year. But what Larry was talking about is the need to be prepared to issue debt preferably through the MLF, since that's an efficient way of doing it, to cover the deficit for the end of the year. Without considering deficit financing, we have sufficient liquidity to carry us through first quarter of next year. So we are in a good position right now in terms of liquidity, uh, but we need to be prepared to cover this deficit. All right, Steve, you're kind of cutting out. You want to take one more shot at uh, your follow-up? Yeah. Can you hear me? We do yes. now. Okay. Uh, with the loss of federal funding for cleaning and revenue shortfalls, is there any discussion or thought about cutting back on the nightly cleaning, especially since the latest CDC guidelines seem to suggest that it's transmitted, you know, in the air, not necessarily by touching surfaces? Well, that's not what the CDC said, right? The public health experts agree that aerosols are probably the primary cause of human to human transmission. Uh, but that it is possible in some cases, and it has occurred around the world, to get it by touching an object. Uh, we in continue, we, we uh, intend to continue the disinfecting regime in place. A and we also hope ultimately to be reimbursed by FEMA. And on to Ben Kaback of Second Avenue Sagas.com. Ben. Thanks. Uh, two questions unrelated. Um, the first, in light of the fact that poll workers need to be at their polling places by 5 a.m. on election day, is there any consideration about restoring overnight service, at least in the lead up to the vote? And then I was wondering if um, there's any update on the R211s, which I believe were supposed to have been delivered, um, at least for test units in July. Ben, on, on the first question, uh, we obviously had a primary election uh, following the uh, 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. closure. We've got robust service. Uh, on the uh, primary election, we were in contact with the, uh, uh, with the Board of Elections and were able to get people, uh, people to the polls, and uh, that's our intent uh, with respect to the general election in November. Uh, sorry, uh, I, what, what was the second part? The R211s, I think the test units were originally supposed to have been del delivered in July, um, and I was just wondering if there's any update on those. Sir? 
No update at this time, I'm told. Very well. We're going to move on to the Long Island correspondent, Pat. Alfonso Castillo of Newsday is next up. Alfonso. Hi, Pat. Uh, thanks for doing this, as always. Uh, a, a question, uh, another question about uh, Larry Schwartz's proposal. Uh, I'm hoping you could spell up what exactly borrowing of $2.9 billion uh, would do. Does it push uh, some of these uh, decisions that you'd have to make that you said could come as early as October uh, or November, maybe into next year? Is it just a matter uh, of buying time? Does it have an effect on how big, if any, uh, fare increase um, you propose uh, later this year? So, so let's be let's be clear, Alfonso. Just to size the problem, right? A our ask, based on uh, our losses of revenue, of expected revenue and taxes and subsidies, to solve for that over 2020 and 2021 is 12 billion dollars. Borrowing 2.9 billion and change from the uh, through the L MLF and accessing that is obviously helpful, but for an agency that spends $300 million a week, that is not a long-term solution. So we will continue working on the MLF option. Uh, we're also going to continue working hard with uh, business leaders and real estate leaders and union leaders and others in New York uh, and, and, frankly, around the country uh, advocating for federal funding. That was one of the reasons we sent letters to our large vendors in the last couple of weeks, and we're gratified uh, by the response uh, from vendors. And they are talking with their uh, elected officials uh, at, at the federal level. So we're going to continue doing that. Uh, and we're going to continue pursuing all these options, including continuing to work on the reductions in service on subways, buses, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad, None of, which any, uh, none of which actions anybody here at the MTA wants to uh, implement. And the same thing with respect to reduction in headcount. Okay, we're going to move on to Paul Burton at uh, Bond Buyer. Paul Burton. Paul. Oh, hi. Uh, this could be for either Pat uh, or Bob. Uh, staying on the municipal liquidity facility for a minute. Uh, earlier this week, Pat McCoy, uh, your uh, uh, finance person, testified before a congressional uh, committee in Washington uh, urging that the f Fed facility be relaxed and extended into next year. Do you folks see yourself tapping into that? Should the uncertainty in Washington continue? And that's something Larry uh, Schwartz uh, attested to when he spoke this morning. Yes, we'd like to see it extended. Um, again, the attractiveness of the MLF in terms of one, guaranteed access and two, low rates, is also the fact that, as Larry said, it can be, uh, it can be called at any point in time. So to the extent that we do have federal funds available, as we are requesting, we could then use this merely as a bridge to get to those federal funds and then pay off the MLF uh, when those funds are available. But we would like to see it continue through or past 1231. Hey, hey Paul, I would just add two things to that. I, I want to acknowledge uh, two people on the MLF. One is Governor Cuomo for designating the MTA as one of the revenue bond issuers in the state of New York that has access to the MLF. And second, uh, I would be uh, um, derelict in my duties if I didn't acknowledge Senator Schumer for advocating uh, that the MTA be included uh, to uh, access the, uh, the MLF. And, and obviously, uh, the bond uh, deal that we did uh, last month, uh, you know, we benefit to the tune of $12 million, uh, and uh, it's been a program that has been uh, helpful to us. Hey, while you're thinking about the MLF, Pat and Bob, the Wall Street Journal emailed a follow-up. How does the MTA calculate how much it can borrow from the MLF? Perhaps you could take that. Uh, that's based on a formula, based on uh, prior year's revenues. So I think it's 20% of, I believe it's the 2019 revenues. So we believe in total we have the ability to borrow 3.4, 3.45 billion dollars. We've already borrowed 450. So the 2.9 that uh, Larry was talking about is roughly in that category of what's available to us. All right, next question. We're moving on to uh, Clayton Gusa of the Daily News. Clayton. 
Hello. Um, I got two questions or two topics I want to ask you on. First, um, Pat, I just wanted to uh, readdress the uh, threatened service cuts um, that might come if you guys don't get the bailout that you've threatened. Um, as you know, um, those kind of service cuts that you've uh, laid out would, uh, you know, are subject to a lot of Title IV regulations, FTA regulations. Are you guys prepared to do the kind of outreach that would come with those service cuts? Have you guys mapped that out? And then at the same time, have you mapped out what you would do with uh, the subway cars that would be vacated, the buses that you wouldn't be using? How, how much have you hammered out the plan to potentially cut service if you, in fact, you need to? Uh, so, Clayton, we're obviously fully aware of the, fub, uh, of the public outreach and whatever law and regulation uh, requires or MTA bylaws will uh, we'll comply with that, of course. We're also aware of uh, Title VI uh, implications, point one, point two. Sadly, the MTA has had to reduce service in the past during prior fiscal crises, so there is uh, experience uh, with that. Three, as I mentioned in my remarks to the board and the public today, we continue to work on the proposed service reductions and layoffs, none of which we want to implement. Uh, and uh, that work continues covering the issues that you described in a myriad list of others. Okay. And then my second question addresses uh, transformation, specifically Mr. McCord's comments today. Um, from, you know, you say, he said that you would accomplish a reduction in a headcount, and he said that he had also made cuts independent of the agency presidents. Um, where, whereas from what I understand, a lot of those cuts were already underway before Mr. McCord even worked at the agency. Can you spell out a few more of those cuts? And also, I had one question about a comment that Mr. McCord made when he was talking about the reduction in force, specifically saying that the COVID crisis has had a big major impact on a lot of the MTA personnel. Is he suggesting that the 131 workers who died at the MTA as a result of COVID um, helped him accomplish uh, the reduction in force that he was seeking? So could, um, thanks for your questions. Could you please repeat the first one? I, just as I was walking oh. over, I missed part of it. Yeah, specifically, what specific cuts have you made that are independent of the agency precedents? What can you give us any specific on those cost savings? So, so the um, reductions in agencies were primarily driven by agency presidents, the CEO Mario, um, under Bob and Pat's leadership and direction. The areas that uh, my team and I looked at are principally those that are in the scope of the Alex Partners report, or the, the functional administrative areas essentially uh, consulting contracts, um, other service contracts that are primarily for functional or transversal activities. So in HR, uh, procurement, finance, uh, and other areas like that. And they amount to $155 million. Okay, and then could you address the second question? You said that the reduction in force um, was in part spurred because uh, many MTA members of the MTA personnel have been affected by COVID. Are you suggesting that the 131 people who have died at the agency helped you um, achieve that reduction in force? So, so Clayton, the, the short answer is no, and, and it's frankly, with all due respect, it's an insulting uh, question that we're not going to engage on. Tim, Tim, what's next? Yeah, we get two more today. Uh, Dan Rivoli at New York One, then we're going to close it out with Steve Burns from CBS Radio. Dan. Uh, good afternoon. On the borrowing and the cuts, does borrowing from the Federal Reserve, this municipal credit facility, um, does that stave off any need for cuts going into this uh, next budget? And I have a second question on the crime and rules of conduct uh, conversation. I can ask now or hold it. So why don't you hold it? So let's just talk about uh, realities, right? Our, our ask to the federal government for the remainder of 2020 and 2021, which is a re relatively short period of time, is $12 billion. Borrowing $2.9 billion uh, under the MLF would be a good thing, right, because it's cheaper money. But the money that we're seeking from the federal government is a grant which would not have to be paid back. Anything we borrow, whether it's from a bank or someone who buys MTA bonds or TB&T bonds, uh, has to, ha, in, including uh, a borrowing uh, through the MLF, has to be paid back. The thing, a uh, couple of principles. One, the only level of government that has the resources to come to the MTA's 
aid is the federal government. The state of New York is itself looking for $30 billion from the federal government. The city of New York is looking for $9 billion plus, right? So that option, which has been available in prior fiscal crises, for instance, Superstorm Sandy, or uh, after 9-11, uh, or the Great Recession, uh, et cetera, not available now, one. And two, uh, borrowing as opposed to getting a federal grant puts us in a significantly different position. One thing that uh, will be preserved in a grant situation, which will not be preserved in a uh, borrowing situation, is the impact on our capital plan, the 2020 capital plan, which is on pause right now. And what was your second question, Dan? Sure. Uh, going to the rules of conduct uh, and rates of crime in the subway. Uh, look, I, I hear what you're saying. It's a, a public health issue. I, I don't think people were defecating in the subway system because it wasn't explicitly laid out in the rules. No, but, no, but hang, 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 no, hang, hang on a second. I, this I like is, my no, but hang on a second. This is not funny or numerous, right? Our customers and our employees, who as President Utano noted, uh, yesterday, uh, you know, uh, customers are in the system for 20 or 30 minutes. If they encounter something like that, it's unpleasant, it's outrageous. Transit workers or a worker uh, on Metro North or Long Island Railroad who encounters that in his or her day, uh, that, that's unacceptable, it's unsanitary, it, it is dangerous, and, and it's disgusting. And, and, and I, I realize some of you have had some fun with the poop question. This is a serious question involving public health and the quality of life experienced by our customers and our employees, period. So to my question on that, because it is serious, you have it in writing, what is the MTA going to do to make sure that it is enforced to its liking and related, you've hired MTA police officers to start going into the subway for the officers you have hired, what has come of that uh, deployment? Where are we seeing the benefits of hiring the, I believe it was a little more than 100 uh, you had hired uh, in this budget cycle? Well, look, they have been doing, uh, the MTA police have been working on the, on the subways, they've been working on Metro North, they've been working on Long Island Railroad. Uh, they're engaged in mask performance in whatever uh, agency uh, of the MTA, uh, they are patrolling and they're doing general uh, general policing. And the last question today is from Steve Burns at CBS 880 Radio. Steve. Thanks, Tim, and thank you, Pat. Uh, just kind of a, a follow up on what Dan was just talking about. I mean, you mentioned, Pat, that uh, the August enforcement from the NYPD was disappointing and not necessarily to your liking, but uh, now it seems like you're putting more on their plate to do. So what's your level of confidence that this is uh, going to be effective here? You want to speak to it? I, I thought you would. <clears throat> I was just going to jump in on a couple things. I mean, on, on the specific point, uh, so, uh, well, I want to go back to Dan's question for a minute about the MTA police. I mean, one of the things the MTA police have been doing in the transit system is responding to and investigating and dealing with the I don't have the number in front of me, but I, I know it's at least 150 worker assaults we've had just in the last couple of weeks. And if you go back farther, you go well into the hundreds. And we've talked about that ad nauseum publicly. And I'm a, a greatly appreciative that it's finally getting covered, but it's something we've talked about a lot. And I'm grateful to, to the members of the press corps who have covered it previously. So that's one of the things the MTA police are doing, those who are in the subway system. We also have NYPD partners who are in the subway system who have done great work partnering with us on those worker assaults and on a bunch of other issues, uh, vandalism, broken windows, uh, uh, several other issues. We've also, as many of you know, hired uniformed contract security contractors to act as eyes and ears in the system because it, there are fewer riders in the system. We want to make sure that because we have insufficient policing, both from the NYPD and from the MTA police, that we've got enough folks in the system who are doing eyes and ears and, and, and preventing and deterring some things that we were seeing early on in the pandemic, like, uh, like break-ins and, uh, and items like that. Um, so, so uh, you know, and going back to the rule uh, changes, I just wanted to comment on that for one moment. You know, I, 
I, at the, I can't remember whether we did it at a press conference or whether it was a briefing, um, but I know I've had this conversation with some of you. At the, at the time that we um, pr uh, proposed these rules, many of, um, many of us had conversations about the fact that what do you use the transit system for? The purpose of the transit system, it's built for this, it's staffed for this, it's maintained for this, is to move people from one location to another. When you're in a moment where literally having people stay in one place, stay in one facility without leaving for hours on end, increases the chances that you are moving virus around. It, we believed we needed to take steps to make sure that people were entering the system, using the system, and exiting the system. And um, you know, I think I wrote an op-ed on it at the time. I, I, I can't remember, but it was right about this time that we were also having to close the system overnight. So I hope that's helpful Good. context. All right, thanks uh, to Pat, Sarah, Bob, and Anthony, to all of you out there. Good afternoon from Lower Manhattan.